What is up, football life? Happy Friday. Welcome to the Deep Thirds Football Podcast. I am your host, Randy Hammond. I am joined by the two men who have joined me for the last three editions of this show. Matt Bushnell, all the way out in Arizona. Ryan Shiner, all the way out in Missouri. Matthew, you go first. How are you and the family doing during this time? Well, we're not at our throats yet. Um, you know, we're just surviving, trying to make it day by day. I feel like we're about to start pillaging other villages, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got a whole squad over there, so I can only imagine everyone's getting at each other at this point. Uh, Ryan Shiner, you just have a couple cats. I imagine you're just chilling, huh? Um, yeah, I've been going to the vet a couple of times. I uh, have dealing with a couple of things for two of them, but uh, I have my youngest youngest kitty right there. I don't know if you can see him. Yeah, oh yeah, close enough. So if you hear me go ow or say who's good kitty, it's from this little guy. I love it. I'm a big cat guy myself. I'm stuck here with my cats and my fiance, in which we had just finished a five day detox. Um, just to try to not be as fat because we had gained a significant amount of weight during this time because of alcohol and other things. So we are trying to better ourselves. Damn. And into and our reward for that, guys, living in the Northeast, we get snow tomorrow on May 9th. So I guess there's no point in working hard for anything in life because that's what I get. Anyway, uh, enough about us. We have a lot to talk about, including uh, especially, I should say, the great game of football because a lot of stuff has happened since we have had, last had a show. Uh, we're going to talk about all the news around the league from a sexual gun encounter to uh, a mega schedule release to, uh, yeah, we're going to recap the draft. We had a three-part draft special, as you guys know, we were a part of. Um, we did a mock of the first round, and boy, was it was it an event. And I was happy to have something to occupy myself that weekend. I don't know about you guys, but that definitely was something I needed. So I was happy that happened. That's going to be the wrap-up of our show today. So but we're going to start off as I mentioned with the news around the league. And the thing making NFL circles right now is Earl Thomas, the Baltimore Ravens safety, former Legion of Boom. Uh, I don't know if he was the leader. I would call him the leader of it anyway. I think he was probably the the best player on the defense at that time. Um, Apparently he got into a little situation with his uh, wife. Um, Him and his brother were uh, a part of some sort of sexual encounter. I don't know if it was an orgy or a threesome situation. I don't want to put any words in anyone's mouth. And then his wife apparently caught him using Snapchat uh, and put a gun to his head with some of her friends and uh, her friends did that same to his brother. And this is just ugly. Uh, this is quite the news to wake up to on a, on a Thursday morning. Um, <laughs> Matt, I'll start with you. What do you make of this Earl Thomas situation? Well, lesson to everyone, just be really careful using technology because you can be tracked, obviously. Yeah. So just – and. I'm not surprised, but man, if you know your wife is going to be crazy and do something like that, you just better keep it at home, man. Because it, look, I've been married for uh, close to six years now, been with my wife for over 13, actually, actually 14 years now we've been together. Relationships are hard. They're not easy. There's ups and there's downs. And I think it's easier to stray away from that marriage when you have money because I think a lot of people look at money as a um, burden that they can't stray away from their significant other. Obviously, they got problems. In, res- in respect to marital problems, I don't want to talk about, you know, what goes on with their marriage. But Jesus Christ, man, <laughs> during the off season, a pandemic, you're going to have a group orgy with your brother? Earl yeah. Thomas, man, it, it, this is beyond stupid. Uh, that's the most impressive part to me like most of the country is like quarantined like how does this even get get assembled i don't even understand um ryan do you have any thoughts on this really odd situation okay so somebody sent me a facebook message be like check out this tweet thread check out this thread on twitter don't like click the link it's just like look at like the synopsis of each one and i was going through each each individual one and i was like okay gun okay you know that that's that's not good more and more i was like holy fuck this is a shaggy song <laughs> like she even called him on camera <laughs> like how do you mean... not how did she, how do you not know that she had an extra key this is a shaggy song it wasn't me uh, that's like, that was the only thing i kept thinking of like i was on my total gym just enjoying my whatever night it was and just, just like okay well i know what i'm listening to next 
Well, no, she, she didn't even have an extra key. It was an Airbnb where they did this at, and they went through the back door, her and three of her friends, two or three of her friends. I mean, so get this. The crazy part about it is she didn't realize there was a round in the chamber. She took out the magazine. So if she oh, would have pulled the trigger because she disengaged the safety, Earl Thomas would have been dead. That is some Tiger King shit. Like, that, yeah, that should have happened in Tiger King. Holy fuck. Yeah, that's my first thought is that kid who thought there was empty. There was nothing in the chamber and he ended up shooting himself. That is, you know, this is, I'm a very loyal person. I've never cheated on any of my for, past or current uh, significant others. I'm very happy to be in the situation that I'm in. I've been with her for almost 10 years now. I can't even imagine doing that in a normal world scenario, let alone during a pandemic. Like, who are these people you're hitting up be like, yo. I'll give you however much money. Meet me at this Airbnb. 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 I didn't even know Airbnbs were allowed to do business right now. They're not hotels, so. so. Okay. They're I mean, le- geez. Like legally, they're not classified as hotels. That's been like a huge thing uh, for a lot of apartment buildings to so try to make sure that Airbnbs try to get classified as hotels in a lot of major cities. But this so was, they don't like throw out all their residents. Well, this was in Texas, right? If because I, I know they live in Texas, their house is in Texas, so I have to assume this took place in Texas, right? Yeah, Austin. Yep. Austin. Okay. So we all know. First of all, Texas is a crazy state. I mean, you could drive through there, and True. laws hey, are different. Austin, weird. <laughs> yeah. Well, all of Texas, Dallas, Irvine, uh, San Antonio, all of it. Houston, take all of it. I hate that state. But regardless of that, <laughs> you know. Just, I could imagine Texas being like, oh, you know, you get together, whatever, 50 or more people. I'm sure they're lifting restrictions as soon as possible. Yeah. So I guess the gathering doesn't really surprise me because, you, man, how many thoughts are out there waiting to get with Earl Thomas? I mean, come on now. People know who Earl yeah. Thomas is down in Texas. Yeah, apparently his brother is waiting for that too, so. That's true. Uh, so, so his so his wife uh, sorry I mean but his wife and his, her her friends were arrested and I gotta say in the TMZ sports article they have a picture of Nina Thomas's mugshot and I, I work in news I see a lot of mugshots and most of them are kind of crazy some just have a you know dead face whatever she looks almost pleased with herself and I have to say <laughs> <laughs> good for her I mean she just looks like I got more to do uh, this ain't uh, this ain't over with yet. Like <laughs> her, she has big eyes, kind of like got like, almost a little bit of a smirk. Like, uh, you know what? Sometimes you have to take matters into your own hands. And you know, if you feel betrayed and disrespected like that, sometimes maybe you don't feel ashamed of yourself. So good for her. Uh, <laughs> and do you guys have any other final thoughts on this situation before we move on? I got one final thought, and I'm just gonna okay. say this. I mean, I, I'm proud for her. I mean. Earl Thomas is going to think, and he's going to go, I mean, it's going to be a task. If they stay together, it is going to be a serious task for him to ever cheat again. She put an imprint in his brain that, you know what, (laughs) maybe I will pull the trigger next time. Good for her. Yeah. My, My reaction, my last reaction to it was more like his... Uh, his statement or whatever about it. It was, it just yeah. happens. What do you mean it just happens? <laughs> like, what do you mean it just happens that you get a gun pulled on you? What do you mean it just happens you're in bed with your brother? What do you mean that just happens? Well, follow yeah, up to I, that. I'm sorry for cutting you off, Randy, but did I assume you guys, did you guys see the Mark Ingram tweet, the follow up? Yeah. Yeah. Was that verified? I think that was fake. I don't think that was real. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, uh, okay, I'm really glad you now. brought that. I can, I'm glad you brought that up, Brian, because if that's something that just happens in your life, I, we live very different lives. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I don't uh, think <laughs> I'm just not a football player. I guess not a real I, football I, player. I will never be in that situation. At least I hope not ever in that situation. And God, I'd probably cry so hard if I ever had that ever happened to me. So uh, we are built differently. And if that's something that just happens to you in your life, then you know, I guess. You know, we'll never be similar people. Uh, All right. So to move on, um, another news that came out yesterday, a controversial rule that the NFL had put into place last year was the pass interference replay, which in theory I think would be a good decision to uh, be able to challenge uh, pass interference calls because it is a judgment call. A lot of them are poor or or bad judgment. And um, 
but what we saw was a poor execution on top of that was at, the refs almost were too stubborn to overturn calls. It's almost like they didn't want to swallow their pride and give them the satisfaction of, oh, yeah, I messed this up. This was a pass interference or this wasn't pass interference. Um, Matt, I'm going to start with you. Um, what did you think of the rule? Did you think they should have stuck with it and tried to work out the kinks? I hated it. I, I think after the experiment, we saw that too many times it just it stayed the same. This coming from a league that it took God knows how many years to determine what a catch is. So did we really expect them to identify what pass interference was going to be? I'm glad it's gone. I, I don't think it makes any sense to try to review these. They happen in real time. It's human error and judgment. Football is played at a rapid pace. And it's nice. If you're going to be able to review pass interference, I think it should be a coach's challenge, first of all. And just get rid of, I guess, let the coaches challenge anything. Keep the keep everything as is. Coaches get two challenges per or per game and let them challenge anything that they want to challenge. If they want to challenge a holding call, let them challenge a holding call. If they want to challenge pass interference, roughing the passer, um, catches, whatever. Just open the book and then your problem solved. So you don't have to focus on pass interference. And uh, you just saw, like, even when they were obvious calls or what appeared to be obvious calls, they still wouldn't get overturned. And I think that was the biggest problem with this, because I think in theory it's a good decision uh, to have some transparency with these calls. But not every not every call can have that. Like, you can't challenge every holding call. But I think pass interference is something that you should be able to challenge in, in theory. But obviously it was so poorly done. Ryan, which is something that you would have liked to see continue or even brought back in the future. I mean, I thought it was kind of dumb when it started, but I think that for very obvious plays and like situations, like something, a play needs to be reviewed. Like you can't say we can't review a play if it was something as obvious as say uh, Saints, Rams or whatever it is, um, mm -hmm. or let's say in like would be scoring plays or on scoring plays. Is that a factor that they can take a touchdown off the board or whatnot? Cause nobody, nobody really knows how to call OPI and really anything. Mm -hmm. uh for, for the most part just whether you know something either happens or it doesn't uh especially within what is in the red zone within the five yard line that's always just going to be a situation it happens probably on most plays it's just going to be a judgment call I really wasn't a fan of it coming in but I understood the need for it mm -hmm. but how the NFL said it was going to be enforced and then just how it would be enforced it's like okay well you probably basically throw a flag on any play you kind of want to at this point um, I basically agree with Matt. Just challenge. You should be able to challenge anything you want, and if you lose it, you lose it. There you go. Especially with something like pass interference, to me, where it's a it's a spot foul, where you could be forty yards downfield, and the safety could just take you out, and then you have the ball at that spot. Um, the yardage matters so much in that instance that if it's a bad call, it could it could change the game. I mean, I think for sure if it's a ticky tack uh, pass interference call, forty five yards down the field, and you aren't allowed to challenge it, it could cost you a game. Uh, and that's going to be a team strat. I mean, teams have literally tried to dial that up before. I mean, I, I think a lot of teams even tried to challenge it on purpose to see if they could get extra yardage from that. So, I'm I'm a little surprised they're giving up on it already. I wonder if the the officials are just like we're not having it. This is a complete blatant disrespect to our ability to call games which they have yet to prove that they're good at that anyway to me so <laughs> well <yeah. laughs> the, the, the issue is this replays should not be handled by the officials on the field it should be an independent referee in the booth or new york let them review all the penalties and have them feed it to the refs be like this is what we saw this is what the call needs to be changed to do how the i, I liked how the xfl had that transparency you heard what they were talking about give the fans that so we talk about transparency yes give us the full transparency don't hide behind you know muted mics and looking at a screen have an independent person review the penalty like i like ryan and i said let let the coaches challenge whatever they want and then in two minutes obviously they can have booth review still and they can challenge you know penalties or whatever else they want but open it up let us hear what you're talking about you know, maybe we don't know the rules as good as we think we do. Maybe that will help us be like, oh, well, that's what the ref saw. So maybe that wasn't a penalty or maybe it was pass interference. Maybe the call was right. But th there's always going to be this scrutiny with the referees until they won. Like I suggested, give us the transparency. Let us hear what you're talking about. Don't hide it. And then second of all, 
open the play, uh, open the book to all review, but review everything. Yeah, I think that reviewing everything might be a little tough, of, a little sticky of a situation, but I get your point. Totally. I'm glad you brought up the XFL thing because what I really liked is the transparency with the review process. You saw what the guy was looking at. You, you went through his thought process with him and you saw the play happen as he saw it. Um, the NFL totally needs to uh, implement something like that where we can see, you know, did he hit him? Did he affect his uh, catching ability? Is the ball uncatchable? All these things that could easily be discussed or is discussed and there's no secrecy to it. Like what is so secret about it? What, like it makes you, it, it opens the door for criticism. Absolutely. But it also is like people who think the NFL is rigged or certain games are rigged. Like that is always going to be a little thought in someone's back in someone's mind when they can't like hear what they're talking about. Like why didn't they throw that flag on the same uh, for the saints game against the Rams? Like, even though I don't think it's rigged because I think the better game would have been uh, saints versus the Patriots anyway, but people are always going to think that when there's some secrecy going on. So they got to change something. Uh, our friend Leon Tompkins is watching the show right now. He made a comment about uh, offensive pass interference should be a loss of down. That feels a little extreme to me because we don't see a lot of penalties that are loss of down now. Um, what is it? Is it a illegal forward pass? And is that even a, a loss of down? What, what are, what offensive penalties are losses of down right now? I'm not even sure I know. Off the top of Intentional head. grounding. Intentional grounding, okay. That's definitely one. I mean, I think an illegal forward pass, I don't think it's a loss of down. I think it's just five yards we play the down. Yeah. Um, yeah. Intentional grounding definitely is. I mean, I, I, I know – well, technically it's not a loss of down, but if your quarterback's in the end zone and you're holding a defensive player in the end zone, that's a safety. A safety. Obviously, you lose right. possession of the ball. Right. So, I mean, yeah, I think only intentional grounding is loss of down. I, I don't well, – but- Go ahead, Ryan. I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say the reason why uh, OPI actually kind of do agree with that because of how infrequent they call it. There is like, are a lot of plays where uh, offensive pass, pass interference could be called, and it's not, especially within the red, in the red zone. Uh, on plays that could be scoring plays, a lot of times they'll more likely just let the offensive player kind of make a, make a move that be declared a football move or not. So you kind of – so with the offensive pass interference, if you're just taking off five yards to save, it's like a later in the game strat, later in the game, you're kind of basically giving giving a chance for the offense to kind of do more of what it wants. Uh, with penalty only being five yards, if you're so close to the end zone, it's really not too much of a penalty. Then back back it up like five, back it up five yards, another shot in a better spot to throw it from. Um, well, my issue is this, Ryan. I. I like the loss of down idea for the simple fact of like that it does change. I agree with the strategy part of it. Some teams, I think it's rare, but I'm kind of 50, 50. I I don't know which way to go because I think on one problem you have with offensive pass interference is that it's going to be ticky tack at that point, because mostly when we see pass interference, it's going to be a push off and how big of a push off are we going to see? extending the arm obviously I think anytime that elbow goes straight you're gonna see it and then it becomes a judgment call for the referee's point of view would the loss of down decrease the amount of calls the referees may know what's in the balance now so they may swallow the flag whereas maybe if they know it's not a loss of down they'll just call it let's retry it so I could see it having a positive effect on the game and also a negative effect, a negative effect on the game for it not being called as much because of the or it could have down. no effects because of how referees already call it anyway. So, yeah, I, I think in the playoffs we saw, I think two major offensive pass interference calls that people thought may have changed the game. Um, I think the Kyle Rudolph, no call where yeah. the saints set thought he pushed off with his arm I didn't personally think that was an offensive pass interference, and I forget the other game. I want to say it was in the AFC where it was pretty, um, pretty blatant. Was it was it the Super Bowl with, uh, with Kittle? Kittle? Yeah. yeah, yep, that's the other one. I mean, yeah, I remember. Yeah, it, it's different. I mean, the offensive pass interference took away the big play. Kittle caught the pass, and people were torn about it. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm iffy about it. I'd have to see. Only if there was a league where we could experiment with this, you know, like if there was like some sort of develop, developmental league that the NFL was just like, you know what, let's help you out guys. And let's just try to test these things out. 
only if there was a league like that. So Ryan, I mean, the CFL still here. exists. Well, their their season's in jeopardy, but yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, um, the situation you're speaking of is the pick play, right? Where it's like an unintentional or unintentional pick uh, plays are illegal, of... but they can be pulled. But they can be pulled off in a way. They can be pulled off in a way if the refs not looking at looking at the correct play or correct area right. where they're supposed to be. So, and but, I was going to say think... illegal, but they don't really yeah. necessarily call it. I think they don't call it too because it's so hard because these coaches are so smart and dialing up play schemes that you can easily have two players cross each other and that guy's still going to run a route. He just gets in the way of the corner or the defensive back and it doesn't look like a pick. We're like, teams don't run obvious like screen and roll type picks anymore. We're like, it's so obvious. Like that was the plan of the play. Um, But yeah, I mean, especially in the red zone, pick plays are so popular because there's not, not a lot of space to get open anyway. Um, I wonder in your situation with the five yard line too, with the loss of balance to five yard penalty, like would teams do that on purpose? Cause they have terrible red zone offense and they want an extra five yards to work with. Like I know watching the team that I root for, they have pretty bad red zone offense. So I wonder if they would be willing to take that extra space. Um, maybe it's just a chess movement to my mind, but I could totally see that being a thing too. Cause these coaches are insane, but uh, yeah. For those uh, joining the show now, pass interference replay, no longer a thing in the NFL. It was one and done. Um, we'll move on to the other news, which is sad news. Legendary Dolphins head coach Don Shula had passed away. Uh, I'm not sure of his age. I apologize. I believe he was 90. Um, but, Matt, uh, you are the football life historian. I don't believe anyone has watched more football tape than you have uh, in the group. So uh, do you have any words about uh, the all-time leading wins leader among NFL head coaches in the history of the sport? And, uh, I mean, on his um, obviously sad passing. Yeah, I think it's impressive, more so impressive that he lasted that long. We see coaches nowadays in the NFL and a lot of major sports. I mean, the shelf life is short. Um, Bill Belichick is not the norm. It's more or less – a very, very select exception of a lot of coaches. Unless you're Marvin Lewis and you have some sort of criminal evidence on uh, the Cincinnati Bengals owner. But I I think Don Shula understood the human side of the game more so than a lot of these coaches. And that's what really makes the difference for a lot of coaches that can relate to players. Because Shula wasn't some authoritarian type of coach. He gave some freedom to his players. Some of those Dolphins teams had some pretty wild personalities on them. But they were fun. They were disciplined. I don't think Shula gets as, gets as enough credit as he should in the grand scheme of the NFL hierarchy. I mean, I think people will look at Bill Walsh, obviously Belichick. I, I, I've heard Parcells mentioned before Shula. Obviously, Hallis is going to be up there, Lombardi. Um Stram is another name that you might associate with Shula and kind of that category, but Shula had some really good teams and we missed out on really seeing what he could have done in this new era of football. Obviously he was ahead of his time letting Marino completely reinvent a lot of, a lot of offense in the NFL. I mean, I remember, watching old highlight tapes of the 85 bears and the one game they lost was to the dolphins and what the dolphins did against that defense was they went four or five wide spread them out all right you know what one two boom football's out and the bears couldn't get to marino in time because obviously marino's one of the greatest quarterbacks that ever lived had such a quick release and shula recognized that shula never put handcuffs on his players he let them play the style he changed his scheme which Coincidentally enough, Bill Belichick changes his schemes to fit his players as well. And I think that's a theme that we see with a lot of great coaches. So, you know, it's sad that Shula passed away. Really one of the trailblazers in the NFL. And it's sad. He deserves his place on Mount Rushmore for one of the greatest coaches that ever lived. Definitely top four. I don't think anyone can dispute that. I wish he won more Super Bowls, but he won two. And that's a lot more than a lot of guys are going to win in their careers. So rest in peace, Don. Yeah. I mean, Matt, that's just beautifully said. It's hard to follow all of that. Obviously Um, when I think of 
trailblazing coaches in the history of the sport. Shula is very quickly a name that I think of. And I'm younger and I might not be this as, as deep in historian as you are. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's Lombardi, it's uh, Landry, it's Walsh, it's Shula. I mean, he's one of the first four names. And, I mean, there's other names of guys who are legends of the sport as well. But Don Shula, like, you cannot tell the story of football as it is now without Don Shula doing what he did for the sport. So, um, Ryan, do you have any thoughts on the tragic passing of Don Shula? Um, nothing as in-depth as Matt said. It was a very well-spoken uh, beautiful speech that he had there. Um, one thing I think, I think of, uh, a lot of people who first start getting into the NFL specifically, you know, obviously I'm 28. Uh, I didn't see Don Shula coach. Uh, my Dolphins memories are more of Laces Out Marino from the Ace Ventura movie, but um, <laughs> it was more of, I think for people who are just starting in, started getting into the NFL, looking at the history of the NFL, Don Shula is one of the first names I think they learn just because he had the perfect season. That's the gold yeah. standard. Every team that has come after either gets compared to the 72 Dolphins, 85 Bears, or, you know, what have you. And it's, it's usually that those two can, can a team ever – do that again? Are we ever going to see another team go undefeated in the regular season of the NFL? There hasn't been one. We don't know if we'll ever see one again. And, you know, that's at least what my impression of Don Shula is. Um, he's basically the gold standard of the NFL. And I don't think there's anything more that we can, I can think of to say about him. I want to talk about that undefeated Dolphins team because I don't think – First of all, they're arrogant, which we all know about it. I, I think everyone can agree that the champagne popping once the last undefeated team loses is kind of absurd. And I understand why they do it, but it just seems in their desperation to stay relevant in today's NFL. But really, it is, it is a forgotten team. You know, what are the 70s famous for? The Raiders with Madden. Um, Steelers. The Steelers, the Steel Curtain defense. I mean, even the Cowboys. Cowboys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the Dolphins lose their place in that history. Hell, the Minnesota Vikings made four Super Bowls, lost all four of them, you know, during that era when Shula was coaching. There's a lot of history. And I don't think that 72 or that undefeated Dolphins team nearly gets enough credit as they deserve. Um. Yeah, I, I don't know enough about it. Like, like I said, I, I unfortunately don't know as much about the 70s as much like as, as like detailed like you do or as someone who had like gone back and watched all the tape. But um, that famous undefeated season, I think we're all we all know. And Henry pointed this out in the comments um, is watching Shula and all those guys from that team celebrate when the last undefeated team loses is one of the coolest yearly traditions. And it's like we are the only team that ever did this. And we're going to keep celebrating until someone does it. And, you know, we haven't seen it done. We might not ever see it done. So, um, Don uh, won't ever be here to see it. And, honestly, I'm kind of happy for him for that because he'll be immortalized for that forever and for all the other things he did for the sport. And uh, my favorite instance of that – favorite version of that is Super Bowl Forty Two because the Patriots were damn close, but they couldn't get it done. <laughs> all right, Matt, uh, beautiful, beautiful job there with Don Chill. I had no doubt that you were going to knock it out of the park there. Uh, we have another team in Florida who made news not long after we recorded the third episode of our draft special. And this is why we're bringing this up because we had a two-week hiatus. Um, but something that really surprised me is one of the best tight ends in the history of the sport, whether, I mean, I don't think there's any dispute about that, but he was recently retired and now he's back. The WWE 24-7 champion, Rob Gronkowski has come out of retirement and the New England Patriots traded him to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to play with his old buddy Tom Brady for a fourth round pick and here we are Ryan are you excited to see Gronk and Brady back together again the term I've seen on Reddit and Facebook and all these other places I keep hearing them play being called the Tampa Bay Gronkineers and <laughs> With the amount of hype that they have, the only thing I keep thinking of, wouldn't it be funny if the Bucks suck? After all this, huh? after all this hype, I mean, they're not going to because they have, like you said, one of the greatest tight ends ever, a gigantic target, one of the greatest quarterbacks ever, greatest quarterback ever probably. Um, 
a uh, very stacked offense. Uh, Bill Pelichek traded away a guy who wasn't going to play for him for a fourth round pick. There was just so much to digest here that I I'm kind of spe- I'm kind of speechless right now because I was thinking, okay, there's no other way the Bucks can really hit a home run unless they get somebody like absurd in their first round pick or they trade off or they get some huge guy. And then it's like, no, they got Gronk. I'm like, what do you mean they got Gronk? He's retired. Uh, Gronk out of retirement, play with Tom Brady headline. Ugh. Yeah. So I don't know about you, Matt, but it kind of makes me feel like maybe Gronk didn't retire from football. Maybe he retired from Bill Belichick. What do you think of? Yeah, I think that's absolutely uh, hit the nail on the head there, Randy. There's no doubt. I, I think Belichick, took the fun out of what Gronk wanted to do. You know, we hear a lot about the Belichick way and how Belichick wants to run his football team, and we see a lot of constraints put on players. I think that's one of the reasons why Brady just wanted Belichick to let loose a little bit and recognize Brady for his greatness as well. I mean, obviously Brady has an ego, but it always kind of felt like Belichick was like, oh, yeah, you know, Tom's good. We're happy we have him. But that was it, you know, and he never really let loose with the team. And I think that hurt, you know, it's, it's in direct conflict with how Don Shula, I mean, could you imagine Don Shula with Brady and Gronk? He would have embraced those two guys. It, it would have been a yeah. fun locker room. Now they may not have won six Super Bowls, obviously quite a few before Gronk was there, but still with the Buccaneers, they, they have a madman as the head coach, Bruce Arians. This guy loves to chuck it downfield. I, I'm going to find it really hard. I don't know who beats the Bucks consistently. I don't – the Saints obviously are the Saints, but you're talking about Gronk on one side of the field, and we know how much Brady loves going two tight ends with O.J. Howard and Gronk. I mean, mm-hmm. they have weapons there. And then you got Mike Evans on the outside. Chris Godwin. Yeah, I mean, the, <laughs> I was talking to someone, and they were like, they still don't have a running game. I'm like, well, shit, man, you're going to have to play seven defensive backs against this offense and just hand the ball off to anybody, and they're going to get four yards. You can't – Ronald Jones is going to look good. Ronald Jones is going to look good this year. Exactly. I, this team's good. Um, God, I forget. One of my favorite defensive coaches, he coached the Jets. Now he's with the Bucks with Arians again. God, I can't remember his name. It's going to kill me. And I know his name, too. It's right on the tip of my tongue. Um, you say he coached in Arizona with him? Yeah, he was a defensive coordinator. He got the head coaching. Oh, T- Todd Bowles? Todd Bowles. Yeah, I love Todd Bowles. I thought he would have been a great choice for the Bears head coaching job. But Todd Bowles is a great defensive mind, and that defense drastically improved last year under his tutelage. I mean, he was fantastic leading that defense. And now they have a top-10 defense. They're going to have a top-5 offense. This team feels like it's Super Bowl bound in the NFC. Certainly one of the best teams in the NFC to me. Uh, the only way I see this really falling apart is if Brady truly is washed. Um, and, I mean, I guess that's a possibility, but it seems like they have a good offensive line. I could see him being rejuvenated with a new system. He really doesn't have to do a whole lot. I mean, he's got weapons that can make plays for him. I'm excited to watch them. And I, I, I've never been the biggest Brady or Gronk fan, but I've always respected the hell out of them. And, obviously, they are the greatest of the great. And, you know, I'm excited – to watch what the Bucks do. And I, like you said, Bruce Arians is an innovator uh, in, in this, this game that we have now. So I think he's going to really do things well for them. Um, I, I couldn't believe when I saw Gronk came out of retirement. I thought, you know, he was committed to the WWE. He had a championship on his mind, like, uh, on his waist even. I mean, he still has it. He's still the champion. Literally could defend it at any time. Uh, you know the WWE loves that, by the way. Like, they're all in on that um, part of it. But I just hope you know, he the loses it. I, I hope he loses it to an opposing player during halftime. Just someone break <laughs> into the locker room and just pin him. Yeah, I think if the NFL was more fun, we could totally see some things like that. But my guess is that he has to lose it before the season starts. Uh, well, maybe like, maybe a preseason thing like on the sideline or something I could I could see too. Uh, but the Bucks, new uniforms, whole new team. I'm excited to watch them, man. That, and We'll, we'll get to the, their first matchup of the season in, in a little bit. Um, but first, we had two quarterbacks who have new homes, which we uh, were trying to figure out where they were going to go for a while. Jameis Winston, um, who I want to touch on his LASIK eye surgery in a minute, but he signed a, a deal to, with the New Orleans Saints to back up Drew Brees. 
Uh, and he just accepted the backup role, and I'm kind of surprised about that. Ryan, do you think Jameis is the successor to Breeze down there in NOLA? I mean, a lot can happen in two years. I think uh, Drew Brees' contract for him to start being a um, sportscaster for NBC Sports, I believe, for their Sunday Night Footballs in 2022. Um, I, if this is their plan, I think it's a pretty good plan. I mean, Jameis has struggled in has struggled recently in the NFL, but um, kind of to your guys' point about uh, guys like May Holmes or, or whoever, I'm not saying that he's that caliber player is, as that but playing behind Drew Brees for a year or two maybe getting just reacquainted with an offensive again offense again with a coach who understands how to coach quarterbacks who understands an offense who makes basically any offensive player a legit weapon uh, with Sean Payton I think that could be very beneficial for Jameis Winston and if that is their plan that then I think that's not the worst thing they could do yeah uh, I think it's a great plan. And I think uh, maybe we see a whole new Jameis Winston because he said he had LASIK eye surgery and now he can read things like license plate, license plates and road signs. Oof. You're telling me this guy couldn't see signs on the road and he was playing quarterback in the NFL. Like no wonder he threw 30 picks. He, no, like how did he not throw 50 picks? Matt, <laughs> you think this is going to work out for him down in the big easy? <sighs> It's it's hard to tell for me for a lot of reasons. I, I think Arians was a bad fit because Arians is the epitome of let's just chuck it. You know, we're going to chuck it. We're going to keep on chucking it. New Orleans, they're going to pass the ball a lot. I mean, it's going to be a heavy pass offense as Sean Payton. I'm not sure how much longer Sean Payton wants to coach. But is Winston's problem that of a guy who can't see or that of a guy who's just too careless with the football? And obviously both those issues can be intertwined. You know, you can't see, but you have to make split decisions of where your guys are at. I mean, often NFL offenses are so intricate and I know Arians is as well. Like, all right, your wide receivers running 15 yards, he's cutting the ball has to leave at this point. So I don't think it's all on the eyes. I, I think there are some definitely issues that has to be coached out of him that he's been, he did it at FSU. He did it at Tampa. And you're telling me for eight years, no one decided to check his vision with everything that these guys go through for physicals. I'm not buying it. I, I, I don't think so. I think there's a lot of things that have to be fixed with him from a football standpoint. Is Sean Payne the guy to do it? I don't know. I would wager that he's not in New Orleans for three years. I, I think it's purely backup breeze if he gets hurt and then, you know, find another quarterback, draft one. I just want to point out about breeze is that he has a job in waiting um, and at, at NBC to do color with uh, Mike Tirico after his contract's up with, but he could totally just call it a career after the season, you know, if the saints win the super bowl or he just decides he doesn't want to do it anymore so james could be plugged into that situation sooner than we would think um and there's also the Taysom hill situation where they were hyping him up like he's lamar jackson and waiting and that they want to just unleash him when breeze is gone so this could be nothing or this could be legitimately the successor to drew breeze down in this new orleans i trust sean payton though to make this work the guy i mean he's playing in a dome a good offensive system I mean, Jameis is talented. We've seen that he can play in, in the league. He does obviously need to clean up a lot of the mistakes. He has very poor judgment. Uh, he's obviously careless with the football. Um, to me, if the LASIK, if his eyes were truly, truly that bad, then this should just make him that much better um, in theory. I think Jameis is kind of on the dumb side, um, personally speaking, so I don't know if it's really going to make too much of a difference. But maybe he can get smarter with better eyesight as well. So we will see about that. Um, the other quarterback I wanted to talk about because we were questioning if this could have been the successor for Tom Brady in New England was the Red Rifle as Andy Dalton returning back home to Texas and he's going to back up Dak Prescott with the Dallas Cowboys. Um, how long before Andy Dalton starts a game for the Cowboys, Ryan? I don't think he does. I think wow. I honestly think the only way he does start a game is if either Dak gets hurt or if they're in a situation where – um, they know they can't adva advance to a higher seed in a playoff towards the end of the season, um, and they're in one of those positions. Uh, Andy Dalton, I think, is coming in specifically just to be a backup. Dak had a really good year last year. 
Um, he's still trying to vie for for uh, contract extension, right? That didn't get solved. Well, they 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 franchised him, so he he's okay. on the tag for this year. Okay, so he's probably so he's gonna want another another pay raise. Um, I think uh, D- Dak's a good quarterback. Andy Dalton, I I don't know. T- to me, if you're gonna make a move at quarterback, I wouldn't go Dak to Dak to Andy Dalton. Um, I think this is just. I think he's a very good. I think he's a very good athletic player. Athletic enough player this to be in this league, obviously. But I don't think this is going to be like a permanent situation. Oh, he's going to he's going to come in because the Cowboys' offense is just so bad or anything. I mean, they had what is it like six thousand yards, like five thousand yards last season, six thousand something like that as an yeah, offense. Yeah. I mean, as far as backups go, I think he's one of the higher end backups in the league. At this oh, of point. course. Um, uh, I mean, Matt, what do you make of this um, Dallas reunion for Andy Dalton? I don't so, – something really seems off to me because of a lot of the, you know, the Patriots, the Chargers, I mean, even the Broncos. There are so many situations, even the Jaguars, that he could have went to and had a legitimate shot at playing. There has to be something. And if you read the contract language, which – gives him escalators if he plays 35 percent of the snaps why would you go to dallas at that point if in order to get to the desired contract that you received i mean three million dollars who signs for three million dollars that has a history that andy dalton has i mean he should be the highest paid backup in the nfl making between 12 and 14 million dollars a year in a really bad quarterback situation like the chargers like the patriots um Heck, we can even go – I mean, I know the Dolphins have Fitzpatrick, I believe. There just seems that probably – I think there was some deal struck between Jerry and Dalton, and I, I think there's really bad blood between Jerry Jones and Dak Prescott at this point. Jerry's like, hey, I'm trying to give you the world. We're trying to be a team here. And I think Dak's like, you paid everyone before me. So mm-hmm. – I, I, I think there's a lot more here. I wouldn't be surprised and call me crazy. And, and I hate going by Skip Bayless, anything with Skip Bayless. But when, when it comes to the Cowboys, he's the biggest Cowboys homer and I hate doing this. But I mean, he said something where he's like, I, I have a feeling that Jerry may rescind the franchise tag on Dak because Jerry has wow. that has there's more to this than what we see. I mean, Dalton's a hometown Texas guy. One, the crowd's going to support Dalton, you know, and then it's all about turning the crowd on Dak. Like, look, Dak doesn't want to be here. Dak doesn't want to play with good players. Dak wants to go be the $40 million man for the Chicago Bears who will miss the playoffs, (laughs) you know? So it, it, it all leads into something. I don't think Jerry Jones just did this to have a backup. I think Jerry Jones did this to send a message to Dak saying, hey, you don't want to play here. We'll get somebody else that will, and we can live without you. I love the drama in the Big D. I'm always uh, with you on that. Jerry Jones is more is uh, almost on the level of Michael Jordan on the petty scale. So I can way totally worse. see uh, way worse. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think that uh, Dak played hurt a lot of uh, a lot towards the end of the year last year, and he played a game in Philly um, last year where they had Cooper rush as their backup quarterback. So he kind of just toughed it out, played and didn't play well. And obviously laboring and injury where in this situation where you have Andy Dalton that you can plug in and play, it could save your season. You know, I think, I don't know if Andy Dalton is the guy I can throw in a, a tough game against Philly and win, but it certainly gives you a better chance than a guy who has one arm and is really banged up. Um, this is all, I think this is a smart move by Dallas because you, I think a backup quarterback in this league is so important, especially when your quarterback is mobile like Dak is. Um, anything could happen to him at any given time, and it's just insurance to me. Well, I don't have an issue with the Dallas part of the signing because, hell, yeah, it's a great deal for Dallas. You get Andy Dalton for $3 million a year as a base salary. Yeah. Hell, yeah, every team in the league would do that for Andy Dalton. But why would Andy Dalton do this? What's in it for Andy Dalton? Well, maybe he sits behind Dak for a year and they let him walk, and then he walks into a situation where he's got weapons. Who knows? I mean, maybe. Maybe, there, maybe there's more to it where they rescind the tag. 
that would be just juicy, juicy drama for me that I would just so enjoy as someone who hates the Cowboys. So <laughs> sign me up for that situation. <laughs> um, all right. So that leaves one quarterback out there that we have yet to see sign with someone who I'm surprised about, honestly. Um, he's a former MVP, guy who made it one, uh, made it to the Super Bowl. Uh, Cam Newton is not signed by any team right now. And I'm, I'm looking around the league. There's not a lot of starting jobs for him. There's not a lot of availability for him out there. So for me, I'm looking and I'm like, where could he go and be the guy right away without question? And I don't think there's any other place other than Jacksonville at this point. I, and I think New England too, but New England's so hamstrung with finances right now. Uh, they can't afford Cam Newton unless he took a super team friendly deal. Um, I mean, Cam Newton's the last guy standing, Matt. Where Where is this guy going to end up? I mean, I think it would have to be the right situation. I, there are not many situations that would actually cater to his skill set in the NFL. Obviously, he'd have to put, play in an offense that's more geared to a running quarterback than most. I don't think Kansas City would be a bad situation for him. You know, he gets coached up by Andy Reid a little bit, sits behind Mahomes, and it it really bolsters Kansas City. I I think for him to really establish market value, one, he's going to have to find a place to play. So that would help. He needs a coach. I I think it's New England at the end of the day. I think he'll take a pay cut to go play for Belichick. He'll reestablish his market value. It's going to be a one-year deal. It works out for the Patriots because then, you know, if Cam works and he does well and he meshes with Belichick, guess what? You got your quarterback of the future, you're rolling again, and you're happy. If it doesn't work, you draft a quarterback in the first round. I just can't see the Patriots willing to go with Stidham to start the season. I mean, that's just so unlike Bill Belichick. Is it? Is it, though? I mean, I could totally see him being like, hey, the greatest quarterback of all time just walked out my door. I don't care. I'm going to go 8-8 eight eight with some guy named Jared Stidham. Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> with Brady, I mean, he didn't even know really what he had with Brady because he had Bledsoe there. I mean, yeah. Bledsoe started the season, and Bledsoe was highly touted. You know, he was still fairly in his prime. And then Brady came in after he was hurt, and they kept on winning games. Belichick was like, you know, I'm going to stick with this guy. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Bledsoe. If he feels that way about Stidham, if he goes 8-8 eight and eight with him, I don't know, man. I don't say that Patriot team has a lot of holes. They need high quarterback play to go eight and eight. I agree. Ryan, Cam Newton, where do you see him going at this point? I just, I just don't really understand why he's not signed at this point already, uh, unless like a team thought they were going to get something in the draft. Um, I have a hot take. Cam Newton, if he doesn't get signed by the time – if Number one, if there is a uh, pre, if there is going to be a preseason and training camp and all this, maybe he shouldn't sign until a team is desperate for a quarterback. Somebody goes down in the first couple weeks of the season, so he can get the contract he wants. Um, you got to keep in mind, Cam Newton for a very long time was the only bright spot for the Carolina Panthers uh, for years. Um, I'm actually going to steal a phrase from Hank Colbert, a group member in, uh, for Football Life. He was the diamond in the dookie. He was basically the one thing. He was a diamond in the pile of shit that was the Carolina Panthers that for the first however many years of his career basically kept them from being the Cleveland Browns. And then after, 20, after 2015, 2016, Carolina kind of reverted back. Didn't They made some really bad choices. But You want to know um, why? Do you know who their GM was during that time? <laughs> <laughs> it was it Gettleman? It was Dave Gettleman, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> but – <laughs> but yeah, I think this I think this is a situation where he could probably actually sit out sit out and just keep keep a scope out keep a scope out, maybe sit out the first few weeks of the season if he doesn't get a starting job because I do, I actually do believe Cam Newton is still a starting quarterback in the NFL. Yeah, he had accuracy dish, accuracy issues a couple of years ago. Yeah, uh play, there's a few players who complain about, "Oh, he didn't throw as good of a ball as Drew Brees." Well, no well, no blank because you know Drew Brees throws the best ball in the NFL. Um, he's still he is still a starting level caliber player, and if he's not signed by July, he should probably maybe think about sitting up the first few weeks of the season and scope out who who's going to need need somebody after they go down eventually. I, I think Leon um, made a good point outside of the box. I think it's maybe Cleveland. 
you know, if Baker Mayfield isn't working with that team and they're struggling, you know, they, they go out of the box 0-4 with everything that they have, OBJ, um, Austin Hooper, Jarvis Landry, uh, Najoku, with that rebuilt offensive line. I, I, Cleveland feels like they have to win now, and maybe it's a desperate move, and I, I kind of like Leon's thinking. Maybe, you know, you can't afford to wait for Baker. Right. Yeah. I, I, I mean, Leon also said the Chargers, which was my original thought. I thought by the time the draft rolled around, they would have had signed him. And I w- there's no way they were running out with Tyrod Taylor. I just didn't envision that being the case. Um, and we'll get to it, but they obviously have a solution at quarterback, at least what they think they have a solution at quarterback right now. Um, Cam's better than a lot of guys that teams are relying on right now. Like, would I rather have Cam Newton than Daniel Jones right now? I mean, it's kind of close. Like, <laughs> I would I would consider it. Um, Jacksonville uh, has Gardner Minshew. Yeah, the Bears, but they have a lot of money tied up in, in holes right now. And <laughs> they're still – I guess they still believe in Mitch, apparently. Um, I like the idea also of the Broncos because they're relying a lot on Drew Locke. And I know that John Elway probably isn't the type of person who likes the type of person that Cam Newton is. But if Drew Locke is just an absolute flop, I mean, there's a guy who won an MVP who you faced in a Super Bowl just out there right now. So I, I, I look at the Broncos as a potential destination as well. Um, I, I, I'm interested to see what happens with Cam Newton. Um, I don't know. I mean, I like your theory, though, Ryan. Why wouldn't he just wait and see uh, what happens? It might be his best bet. Who knows? Well, you know, it's like my philosophy on um, – I, I know this is kind of teasing into the draft, but like with the Bears – if if you don't love one quarterback and if you have 10 of them, then you don't have any quarterbacks, you know, like sure. go get Cam Newton. Uh, Chicago just made a lot of sense. You want to go get Foles. I mean, this just pisses me off because you see a lot of teams with really good defenses that are just wasting away that defensive championship window with quarterbacks that they're trying to, you know, fill a hole. Jacksonville was a perfect example. You know, they, they had a championship caliber defense and they wasted away with Blake Bortles. So, so sometimes you just got to cut your losses and go with the guy that you think can get you there. Yeah. Um, I'm, I mean, we'll have to just see what happens with him. I can't believe he's the last man standing, but um, maybe it's the way he types with the weird text that turns people off because come on, you're like 30 now. Just, just type normal. Is it that hard? Is it? I don't know. Um, all right. What came out yesterday And if you're kind of sick of Korean baseball, I'm not sick of Korean baseball. It's the only thing going on right now. But football is king. We know that. What other sport could have a four-hour special on a schedule release other than the NFL? None. There's no other other sport that can even think about that. Um, And we'll get to if these games will even take place. But the NFL released their full 256-game schedule for all 16 teams uh, as if they are going to happen in full, including in New York and New Jersey, which – don't get me started on that, but there's some exciting matchups right off the bat. The Giants aren't playing the Cowboys, and they don't play till Monday, so I can enjoy the first week, the first day of the season without any annoyance. So I'm excited for that. Any main takeaways from the schedule release for you, Ryan? Um, well, one thing is that I, that I always uh, think is really weird, uh, and I think I actually told you this before that I think it's just really weird that they had a TV special for this. Like, kind of reminds me of, like, Marvel having those, like, big, huge convention things being like, we're going to announce that we're going to have five movies over the next five years and stuff, and people (laughs) just go out there, eat it up, and clap. Like, I clap because I know Star Wars! And... Is that Christmas? (laughs) Yeah. Um, But the other thing to keep in mind is that we actually don't know who the teams are going to be until about week four or five-ish. But the one thing that kind of jumped out to me were uh tom was tom, the tampa bay gronkineers sorry it's it's <laughs> it's saved that way in my phone now i can't i can't get it out i need to it, clear it, that out it's, it's like may homes for you yeah um i can't get so i can't get that on my phone but i uh, uh their last what like six or seven games are either played at home or in a dome and with uh, having an Asian quarterback like Tom Brady, with Tom Brady and having it down the stretch, we're basically going to be playing in nice weather, almost guaranteed for the last, like, half of the season. I think that's kind of a big thing that sticks out. And the other thing were the time slots. Uh, why are the Rams in primetime so much? What did we do to deserve this? 
Well, they have a new they have a new stadium that no fans are allowed to be in. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> they have no first round picks for the next three years. That's why. <laughs> um Matt, uh, looking at what happened yesterday with the schedule coming out, I love when the schedule comes out because, Ryan, I know that it's, like, pointless. It's like, oh, my God, these things are happening at this time. Especially now with no sports, it just gives you something to look forward to. Like, you could put it on the calendar until, you know, things can change. I expect them to. But for now, it's like, oh, yeah. Like, for me, every year, it's like the Giants are playing the Cowboys week one. All right, great. Yeah, cool. This year they're not, and I was so happy to see that they weren't. And then they're on Monday, and I don't have to watch them lose on Sunday, and I can enjoy the first week of the season and not be pissed off at anything, except for my fantasy team. But that's usual anyway. But like, and I, I just, it just gives you something to look forward to and see like weird things, like what's Thanksgiving going to look like? Oh, is there anything on Halloween this year? Or what? Like the holidays for me are big because I, I plan sports, like I plan things around sports all the time. So. For me, it's just looking forward to something. Like, put a date on it. Like, and that's what I like to see about it. Like, I just like to see, like, maybe I can go to a game here. Maybe, like, the, you can map out their team's win-loss record as of right now, which is stupid. But it's fun. It's just something to do. But, Matt, schedules came out yesterday. What did you think of it? I always like the schedules. I, I think, it, like what you said so eloquently, it, it, it gives me something to look forward to. And, you know, a couple podcasts ago, I was complaining, you know, the, I'm doomed to experience the Bears going eight and eight. So I look at the schedule and, and I'm happy about this because they're not going eight and eight. They're going seven and nine. You know, th- this is a great gift and I'm glad they gave it to me. There's a stretch. I think it's between weeks five and 12. I don't know if they have a winnable game in that stretch. I mean, there's a stretch where they could go 0-1-7, Randy, 0-1-7. I mean, it just – I mean, I I think they'll beat the Falcons. I think the Falcons are pretty bad. But I'm computing in my head like, okay, all right, (laughs) what games? And the NFL schedule makers did me a favor. No Bears games on Thanksgiving, Christmas, Halloween. None of that for me. This season may save my marriage. (laughs) So, you know – Save your marriage. Oh, boy. Yeah, oh, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you. I mean, I may not ha- – I look forward to the, the biggest gift that they gave me, Randy and Ryan, the biggest gift. The Bears don't play the Packers until weeks 12 and 17. What that means is by that time, I fully expect for the Bears to be eliminated from the playoffs. So I don't even care what they do against the Packers. <laughs> See, I have a different idea. For me, that meant the NFL is more optimistic about the Bears. Because usually, usually week uh, it was like week 16, 17, they always won divisional games. Uh, they didn't do that with the Bears this time. But uh, the fact that we're playing Green Bay, they think that means the NFL thinks we have a shot at making the playoffs. Do you think the NFL no. believes? Because in they, the they love having divisional games that last week. A lot of times you get a divisional championship game, essentially. And it's usually whoever gets to play, the, it's usually the Packers and Vikings. Or it's usually the Packers vying for a higher playoff spot and hoping the Vikings drop out. I think this means because they have us playing the Packers and not like the Lions that late, that they think hmm, maybe they'll be good. No, no, no. Nope. They'll be okay. Nope. And you want to know why they did this, Ryan? The Packers are going to have the division locked up by week 17. What better time to give the world a glimpse of Jordan Love? Then versus the Chicago Bears at Soldier Field. So I can watch the future Packers quarterback kick the living dog shit out of the Bears for the next 15 years. You think the Packers are going to have the first round bye locked up? They're, they're going to have the division locked up. I mean, first round bye. I, I don't know. I, I think – so here's what I looked at. The 49ers have a tough as hell schedule. I mean, anytime you have, I think, four consecutive games on the East Coast, then you travel back to the West Coast, and then you have to travel back East to face New England. I mean, the schedule makers did San Francisco no favors. And plus, that West division is going to be really tough. I mean, obviously, the Rams are hanging on by a thread, but I fully expect the Cardinals to be a lot tougher than they were last year, thanks to your Cliff Kingsbury and having DeAndre Hopkins now. And Seattle is always a bitch for San Francisco to play. Those games are going to be brutal. I, I don't see the division winner 
coming out of the West with more than 11 wins. You get 11 wins out of with that division, my hat's off to you. Now, the Saints and the Bucks, that's going to be more of a battle. NFC East should suck like it usually does. So it's going to be an easy road for the Green Bay Packers to at least get a bye again. Yeah, I I think that every person who roots for an NFL team looks at the NFL schedule release and they are just like, who does my team play when? And they look at the teams and they go, win, 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 loss, win, loss, win, win, loss. And then every team somehow is 10 and 6. It makes no sense, um, unless you're me. Because the funny thing about the schedule release is you know who you're playing before they release the schedule. You just don't know when. So I said 4 and 12 before the schedule even came out. And when the schedule came out, I still stand by 4-12 and 12 for the New York Football Giants. So I don't think anything different of the schedule. Um, I just like to see, you know, when they play certain teams. And um, I'm trying to get this giant schedule to load right now, and it's not working. But um, my birthday is two days after Christmas, and on occasion it falls on a Sunday. Um, five years ago this was the case, and I was so looking forward to the Giants playing on my birthday. I was so excited. You know what happens? The week before, Odell Beckham Jr. decides to assault Josh Norman on the field and get suspended for the next week's game. So I don't even get to see the best player on the Giants play the game. And if you didn't know, Eli Manning without Odell Beckham Jr. for a long stretch was a pretty terrible quarterback. So they played the Vikings and got absolutely smoked on my birthday. It was so much fun. It was a Sunday night football game. I was hammered. Great time. Uh, I don't even really remember what happened. I think Eli threw three picks. I don't even care. This year, you know what the NFL gave me for a favor for my birthday that's on a Sunday what? this year? What? I get to enjoy Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens just absolutely shitting all over my favorite team. So thank you, NFL, for already ruining my birthday. So, um, yeah, I am really appreciate the NFL doing that solid for me. Um, so thank you there for the NFL. Um, love that. Good early birthday present uh, in May while I'm quarantined. Love that. Um, but there's some, like, we touched on our team, we touched on the Bears, touched on the Giants a little bit. Um, my favorite thing about the Giants schedule, I will say before we move on, is they play the Bucks on a Monday Night Football game in week eight. And it's Tom Brady, obviously, and you know all they're going to show are Super Bowl highlights from the Giants. And that's going to be the highlight of my whole season is that. Um, anyway, the some of the things that's, uh, that uh, kind of surprised me, not surprised me, but that uh, excited me a little bit, was we get a rematch of the AFC Divisional Round to start the year with the Chiefs and the Texans. Obviously, that was the game that the Texans jumped out 24 nothing, and the Chiefs scored seven straight touchdowns, like unlike anything we've ever seen before. Uh, and the week one matchup I'm looking forward most to is those Buccaneers going into New Orleans and facing the Saints. Uh, so that matchup, I think, is the best week one matchup um, in general. One quick nugget about the schedule, though, before we move on, unless you guys have any final thoughts, is the NFL's playing on Christmas this year. Uh, Christmas is a Friday, so this is the first time the NFL is ever going to play on a Friday, I think. Uh, that's interesting that they're kind of – it kind of tells me that they're going at the NBA a little bit. Like, we're not just going to let you have this holiday. Um, I don't know what you guys well, think about that. but Well, uh, the NFL generally doesn't play uh... – they would never play on Fridays because they don't want to like upset the high school schedule or whatever. And yeah. gen generally they have actually, an, an, there's an antitrust suit that caused the NFL to not play on Saturdays. So the only reason why you see the NFL play on Saturdays in December is because that's when college football is over and they're actually mm -hmm. allowed to do it. It's kind of, I think Friday may be paired with that. It's been a while since I've actually looked at that suit, but um, uh, the NFL's never, yeah, I can't remember the last time I've seen an NFL game on a Friday. The only other thing I, noticed i saw weird a really weird stat with the schedules i can't remember if it's twenty nine thousand or twenty six thousand, but it somebody said the seahawks travel the most miles this year out of mm -hmm. anyone by far and it's like they hit these fly like what like twenty nine thousand miles and the next one mm -hmm. is like sixteen thousand or something yeah and the 49ers are the second yeah i mean that makes sense based on ge uh, geography anyway and the ravens yeah. The Ravens travel the fewest amount of miles, like the the, four, the fewest amount of miles out of any team in the last four years. Like they don't go wow. anywhere. Yeah, huh. it's, it's crazy. Nice gig if you can get it. One thing I wanted to touch on, and I'm not sure if you guys read this at all, but two things, Randy, on your Friday NBA schedule thing. There was a thing floating out today where the NBA executive committee is planning to start the 2021 NBA season in January. So they may okay. not even start it until January. 
Second thing is the NFL purposely has a hypothetical, I guess, escape hatch on the NFL schedule where if there's quarantine and there's issues that they will move the Super Bowl back two weeks or two months and they'll take the first eight games and just flip it to the last eight games. Yeah. So that way they'll let, they'll try to let this thing blow over. So that's important for a lot of states. Most importantly, I think for Illinois, because Pritzker, the governor of Illinois, will not lift the 50 person gathering ban until there's a vaccine for the coronavirus. I mean, you brought up uh, something I want to transition to anyway, is if we could talk about the schedule and all these things, but will these games actually take place is a big question right now, given the fact that sports have kind of come to a halt here. Um, I love the plan that was laid out, like you said, that if they have to push things back two months, they pick it up in week nine, and then one through eight, you just start again in January, and we will just play the Super Bowl in March. I think that's a great idea. Um, I don't think that's a bad backup plan at all. But the problem with this situation is individual states are in control of their own destinies here. And unfortunately, they are and they're not because they can't control the virus per se without some sort of vaccine or if people can test antibodies and come to a conclusion that you're immune after that. And I'm no scientist. I'm not a doctor. I can't make those assumptions and neither can governors or any sort of state government. Um, I would be legitimately shocked if any pro sports or any sports at any level plays in New York um, until 2021. Um, Governor Cuomo has done, I think, an okay job at handling this, but he is not going to allow gatherings in the thousands um, for sporting events, I think, for a while. I could see games taking place uh, in alternate locations without fans. I could even maybe see games happening there without fans. Um, That part is less likely to me, but I could see the season happening in southern states, states with warmer weather, um, states that don't have as many restrictions, obviously, and they can adjust based on um, what, is, what is available. And th- this is why schedule makers get paid what they do. But if something doesn't change here in a couple months, that's something that they're going to have to talk about. So I think that we shouldn't just look at the schedule as it's set in stone because a lot of things are going to change. Um, but I, I'd be shocked if the schedule takes place as is normally like it usually does and uh ryan what are your thoughts on if the schedule can take place in 2020 um i don't think anything's going to happen period until 2021 i think that's just a reality that we just kind of have to accept um you know they're, they're already canceling like most large gatherings in july and august and i'm just going to say if i can't see green day I don't think that there's, or My Chemical Romance or Weezer, I don't think I can go and say that there's going to be a football game played in any major city. Another thing to keep in mind, though, even though these, uh, a lot of southern and midwestern states uh, aren't really doing a, the most, aren't, aren't really doing a lot to, in terms of like restrictions or whatever. I mean, Missouri Governor Parson just said, last, this past week said, open up everything. It's fine. It's fine. Go back to normal. We're going to have sporting events because they want Cardinals playing. But um, individual mayors are still instituting these uh, restrictions and bans. Like Kansas City is still going to be on a ban until like at least like in the next two weeks or so. There's a still extending because that was what their initial order was going to be. So I, I just don't think that there's a reasonable way we can expect to see a game where a major portion is guys having to have face uh, hand-to-hand, face-to-face contact with each other, or clo- close, close encounter contact with each other. Um, and let alone having, you know, 80,000 people in a stadium. That's just not going to happen that, in this year. I, I don't think there's any chance fans are in the stands this year. Um, I, I'd be really surprised. I know that I read that the Dolphins are trying to come up with a plan to maybe they have a stadium that holds 65,000 people to maybe have, a, a you know, 10,000 people be there and be able to spread them out far enough to still be there. That seems kind of uh, a, a problem to me. Uh, it's still too many people coming in and out, uh, too many chances for things to spread. Um, I know baseball and the NBA are trying to come up with a plan to do mass testing of everyone involved, and maybe there is some sort of quarantine involved, and I wonder if the NFL could do the same thing, um, where they all the guys are tested and you know they're good to go. So if they are punching each other, sweating on each other, like they're not going to harm each other, I think that's probably more difficult considering the, the staffs of NFL teams are, are much larger. Um, than NBA teams especially. Um, 
I, I freaking hope that there's football, man. If we lose snaps from this, I, I that's when I'm going to really start getting ornery. And I could make a, I could, I could make a water boy reference here, Matt, for you, but I think you know where I'm going with that. Yeah. This is where the struggle really comes in here because to Ryan's point, I mean, you're trying to control how the virus spreads and not so much, you know, you have to worry about the skill position play. I mean, just the line play itself is going to, it's a bacteria cesspool. And then you talk about pads. I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but I played a long time and every year my pads just reeked. I mean, it was easily the worst smelling part of any of my equipment because I mean, you just can't wash shoulder pads. I mean, they're hard to wash. All, all, all the pads are. So I, I just take a look at this in, in a realistic standpoint. When do we finally say, you know what? We have to be responsible. We, we have to deal with the most important part of this and that's the safety of the general public and just cancel the sports season for 2020. Let's kick it back up in 2021, see what medical progressions we've made with this thing. I mean, because it's not so much the people that are asymptomatic, because we all know that we can carry it. Um, there are some people that have antibodies to it. What about when these players go home to their kids? I mean, I read an article today where they have found that children that, you know, it's a small percentage, but children that have COVID-19 can develop Kawasaki disease. And that's the inflammation of the blood vessels inside the body. And we're talking kids between where this only pops up between zero and five years of age. Now they see kids coming in at 14 with Kawasaki disease. I don't think we fully understand the extent of how bad this could get. And I fear that with the easing of restrictions and they already said this thing's going to come back. I, I, I'm worried about it. I think it's just better that you start clean in 2021. I, I'm optimistic that there's, you know, Korean baseball happening and there's some other things happening in other countries, but, but um, obviously. Well, I, no, I go ahead. To, yeah, I'm sorry to cut you off there, Randy. Th this is where it takes that political turn because what South yeah, Korea yeah. did, th they shut everything down. They're like, we're they not did. doing jack shit. And if someone had it, they traced it to every person that person had in contact and they put them in isolation. So they totally contain the disease we're past containment and, that's done well, another important thing with south korea too is that even afterwards so they, when they were doing antibody tests they thought okay well you got it they'll be fine they were finding out people who already may have had who have already may have had it we're getting it again and mm -hmm. there's just so much we actually don't know about this right now that to me it's it blows my mind that we have so many states and so many people coming out and saying well, we want, our, we want our college football, we want our NFL, and th this, this is how it has to be, because I'm going to be damned if football doesn't come out. It's like, you know, there's, there's more important things in the world than yeah, seeing Randy. the guy. There's more important things in the world than seeing your team lose every Sunday. Look, it would, it would probably uh, be good for my mental health if I didn't have to watch the Giants in, in 2020. But <laughs> there you go. I just want to watch – I just love football, man. Yeah. I, just, no. I, I want yep. – I, I and I Leon Leon brings up a good point, and I want to hear from everyone here about uh, you know what you think about the potential season here. But you know the NFL will push uh, Sunday ticket to have, force a season, he says, and I think that the NFL more than any other sport is a great television product. So if they could be isolated somewhere, and you say you know you can't go see your family, blah blah blah. And I mean it's not that realistic, but. I mean, they could come up with a plan where you're all in a remote location, you're tested, and you're not allowed to go see your kids. So that way, there's no spreading. You're all within each other. Maybe it could work. Randy, you bring up a good point because there's only, out of all the professional sports leagues, there's only one immoral enough to have a season, and that is by far the NFL. The NFL, out of every professional sports league, just be like, shit, man, we're the NFL. We're fine. And yet, I, I, I can see them pushing the NFL Sunday ticket. If they want to do that, fine. You know what? Contain the players. Like, hey, we're paying you a gazillion dollars to play football. I'm sorry that you can't go see your family and kids for the next 16 weeks or, you know, 25 if you make the Super Bowl. 
But this, we're, we're having a season. It's going to be on NFL Sunday ticket. Sorry that your stadiums are empty. But I wonder, the NFL has a deal with DirecTV or AT&T now, whatever crap that is. I mean, there's only 15 million people subscribed to that garbage. But would they make Game Pass live at that point, you think? Would NFL Game Pass serve as a live broadcast for every NFL team? No. So, you, well, you like, but they have still have TV deals with major networks. I don't know if they would be able to do that. You mean broadcast it on their own? Well, the, the broadcasters it would still be like the out of market games. Like you would still have your in market okay. games. But like, if Ryan wanted to watch the Chicago Bears versus the vaunted Detroit Lions Week One, but he had the Kansas City Chiefs. Or I'm 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 not sure. I think the Kansas City plays on Thursday. Whatever uh, it doesn't really matter. So. Yeah, but but he wants yeah. to watch the Bears now. Normally, he would have to have Direct TV to get the Sunday ticket package. But would the NFL be like, hey, you know what? Special circumstances. We're going to live these games. They're going to air live if you pay for NFL Game Pass. There's a whole lot of red tape that is not going to allow that. I mean, you have to say like ESPN. Have you guys ever used ESPN Plus? Okay, no. so ESPN Plus, so I don't, actually don't have cable, and uh, I was getting ESPN Plus for how they were advertising it. It seemed like that you were actually going to be able to watch live games from ESPN, like college football or whatever, on that app. They Games that were live on ESPN, ESPN2, SEC Network, ABC, except everything that they own, could not be simulcasted on that unless you already had a cable subscription, DirecTV, or whoever – whatever some kind of TV subscription. So to me, I don't think there's a way that the NFL will be able to do that because, I mean, if ESPN's doing that, of all things, I mean, ESPN would probably be making a killing saying, we have all your live games come to us, don't go through this middleman. Um, just I don't think that there's – that's going to be able to happen. So well, 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 keep in mind, though, I mean, you still get to watch games for free on Fox and CBS. I mean, you don't need a cable subscription. You just need – I mean, an HD antenna. and you Correct, can the but they can't even show ABC games on that. And ABC, you don't yeah, need a subscription the, either. Yeah. I mean, I, I have an HD antenna, like like you, Ryan. Yeah, same here. Yeah, I, I cut the cord. I was like, I'm not paying for direct TV and all this other cable nonsense. So I, I do a lot of streaming. And obviously, I share passwords with people. You know, I know people that have cable and, you know, the, for a small fee or a small bartering, we uh, exchange passwords for certain services. And that seems to work out pretty well for us. You know, I, I think that's something that you can work around feasibly if you know people. I just, I, I would hope that people would realize during this situation, if we're going to do this, I think the, if, if any league has enough pull has enough like we can put your balls in a vice grip if you don't do this for us the nfl's that league the nfl could be like you're gonna do this because guess what if you don't when our contract expires in two years <coughs> you will never have an nfl game on your channels ever again i i think that's a uh well, there's contracts involved. You can't just like right. like Ryan said. You, you you can't just ignore those contracts, and and it no. can totally be bad business. I mean, it would be bad business, Randy. But you can always work out a deal. Like you know, let's just extend the contract a year. You know, something, and then they can charge. I, I know there's I mean, there's a lot tape. of red tape and law lawyers they have to get involved, even to do stupid stuff like that when it comes to like broadcasting and what you can show on TV, on, on TV copyright how long you have the yeah. copyright it's there's a whole lot of junk you have to do even for like something small like that and that i mean i think it would be common sense to be like hey let's let's just do a quick thing but it's just they have it set up so intentionally difficult to not let that happen i mean could i see some agreements being made because of the circumstances yeah i guess maybe but i I don't know, man. I think that if those games are going to happen, you're going to want to be on those major networks. That those guys are hurting for ratings too, and the NFL is such a money maker for all of these places that they're not going to be willing to just give it up for something like that. I'm just going to throw it out there. I work for a major cable company in America, so if anyone needs something, just, you know, a password or something, just reach out. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. Slide in them DMs. 
Yeah, so main event of the evening. It took way longer to get here than I anticipated, but that's a good thing. We have some good conversation going on here. God, please let there be football. Please let there be football. Um, the NFL draft happened despite all of this. It happened virtually, and it honestly went really, really well, if I say so myself. I enjoyed it. Not many glitches. Um, some horrifying things for every draft person drafted person uh other than that i really enjoyed my experience watching the nfl draft um overall takeaways from the draft matt you can go first i if if anything this humanized roger goodell like you (laughs) got to see his man cave his book collection (coughs) him interacting with virtual fans i i liked it it came off a lot better than i would have expected i thought it was funny seeing the gms with their kids and the coaches biggest highlight of the night was cliff kingsbury's mansion good (laughs) god for us arizona folks i i know where that is at what area he lives that's a nice area man him and his loafers just chilling back on his couch with the nice view of the mountain i mean god bless them yeah Ryan, uh, I know that you, you were expecting some some things to happen in the draft. Um, overall thoughts of the draft itself? Well, the NFL was very smart. I'm not letting the GMs be mic'd up. Uh, we didn't hear anything racist from Jerry Jones. I was expecting to hear that, have him mic'd up. I was expecting to hear a lot of F-bombs. Uh, but honestly, for the virtual aspect, I think uh, as somebody who – on and off watches the draft. I mean, I, I used to only watch it if like people wanted to, wanted to watch it or if like in Missouri he had a bunch of players or if the Bears were going to draft really high. But um, the – because a, a lot of it I'm not really into. It's like, okay, yeah, they're on stage. It's like graduation essentially. Okay, oh, he's talking to the commissioner. Okay, oh, whatever. I think seeing the moments with them and their families – made this a lot better because it kind of felt a lot more real it wasn't just like a show oh, i'm going to do this to, for showmanship it really felt like this is a big moment in their lives they were letting us see this big moment and with the people around them this just was i don't know it, it was probably one of the better drafts i can remember watching um especially in the first round just because of that element yeah, uh, Matt, you mentioned how you thought it humanized Goodell. I have one Goodell complaint, and this is just me being um, maybe a little picky, but one of my least favorite things about – okay, so this is for the wrestling crowd here too, but Kurt Angle, we used to get – when he came out uh, to his entrance music, everyone would chant, you suck at him. Um, and that was like a genuine thing, and it used to be something he really hated. Um, and then towards the end of his career, he used to orchestrate the crowd and do the you suck. Like, he wanted it to happen. Like, yeah, come on, champ, tell me I suck. Yeah. Roger Goodell is, like, telling team and fans of teams to boo him. Like, come on, let me have it. Boo me, boo me. Like, no, this is not how this works. You're not allowed to encourage us to boo you. We boo you because you suck. And that is, like, the only thing for me. Like, you can't just tell us and to boo you and that you're going to like it and that's what you want. No, you don't want it. We know you don't want it. Stop, stop with the charade that you want to be booed. You have guys, like, you have a Zoom box with, like, 30 people on it. They're fans of team. Like, Guy Fieri's in the crowd of the Raiders booing Roger Goodell. Like, no, Boo naturally or I'm going to do the opposite because I don't want you to be happy or satisfied with this experience. Do not tell me to boo you because you know you're going to get booed. It's fine if you expect it. But it's going to happen because you're terrible, not because you want it to happen. That's my biggest complaint about Roger Goodell. In all fairness, from the, uh, from the draft. there are tons of people who are like that, though. I mean, Primus, their big thing was that they would come out and they have the crowd chant, Primus sucks, Primus sucks. And, uh, yeah. uh, who, God, who, who was the other one? Uh, there was another one who was exactly like that, Matt, and it's just blinking my mind right now, and I can't think of it. But, yeah, there's people like that who are just like, eh, you're going to boo me, whatever. It's funny. Oh, Ron Emanuel, that's the guy. He got booed okay. at the Blackhawks parade, and he thought, and he just erupted with laughter when they announced his game. He just got booed. Um, so, and some, and some, some nice early draft, hi- and some, some of the draft highlights from our, our viewers here. Leon Tompkins said the women involved, uh, which CD Lamb had one of the moments of the night to me when he got drafted. He has two phones. His girlfriend sits next to him. He's on one of the phones, and she takes the other one, and he so casually just snatches it from her. Like, no, 
like I, what is going on there? I don't know, but that was one of the funnier things that came out of the draft for me. Um, and other women related things. I know that, um, I think it was, was it Chase Young or was it, um, was it Brown? And they got drafted. Their, their girlfriend would just try to stand next to him the whole time, like not give him the spotlight. Like they, they wanted to be on camera the whole time. Like this was about them. It was almost like the Russell Wilson picture when he got drafted and that chick that he was with was going nuts. <laughs> and obviously she's long gone since he's married to Sierra at this point. Um, but yeah, there was a little, yeah. A lot of good women moments. Good room to me, though. So Belichick, Belichick's husky dog, <laughs> and they they CG him, and it says Bill Belichick head coach, and it's just the dog, absolute gold, for, like perfect meme for the internet. And um, the other one was, did you see Mike Brable's room? What the hell was going on in there? It looked like somebody was taking a dump to the left. Another guy was dressed up in a costume, and they were obviously like practicing social distancing, but it looked like the most awkward hostage situation that I've ever seen in my life. So it shout def- out to- <laughs> yeah, gonna say, it definitely ahead. looked like no one wanted to be in that room. <laughs> Not at all. It was, the one that it got was me def- was that Joe Burrow's mom looks like that bitch Carol Baskin. <laughs> like they showed her and my jaw dropped. I was like, no <laughs> way. No way. Yeah. I I love the I love the draft. I was so impressed by how there was no technical difficulties and, and no major glitches of any kind. I'm just really impressed by how they pulled it off. But let's get into some some actual picks here to have an overall synopsis. Um I was gonna think about doing like where we were right, where we were wrong, but I think that would take a really long time because let's just say we were really wrong in a lot of things, and that's expected for the mock draft. So <laughs> um I'm just gonna say Give me a decision in the first round, especially that really, really surprised you, Matt. That's a good question because I mean, I'll say to the overarching theme of it, I, I thought, what was it, seven or eight defensive backs drafted in the top in the first round, and they really started flying off the board towards the end of the first round. I thought the run on them was interesting. And the one guy who wasn't drafted in the first round was Jalen Johnson. And I was legitimately shocked that he wasn't drafted in the first round. I was just like, man, obviously the bears got a steal with him in the second round. I thought, I thought that was a home run pick for the bears. I mean, Ryan Pace gets an all pro dumped in his lap in the second round again, but I don't, people are going to kill the Packers for this. And I just want to go into it. And it's going to surprise people that they traded up one to get Jordan Love and not help Aaron Rodgers. The Colts were going to take Jordan Love next. I mean, that was already a done deal. From everything that I read, Jordan Love was gone after that pick at 26, I believe. If the Packers, I'm done questioning their quarterback evaluations and picking people. If they tell me that Jordan Love is going to be their quarterback of the future in three years, he couldn't have fell into a more perfect situation. He gets to sit behind a veteran quarterback who's really, really good for three years. Matt LaFleur can fix any mechanical issues that he may have, anything that he doesn't like, teach him how to run his offense to a T. I mean, it just makes a lot of sense. And kid you not, there's a lot of people in that Green Bay organization that hates Aaron Rodgers. Like, they will pop champagne when he's gone. So this accomplishes two things for them. I'm not – it doesn't surprise me. I'm pissed that the Packers got him, but it makes a lot of sense. See, I, I just don't love the idea that they traded up for him, and I didn't see that the Colts um, wanted to take him there. But I, I trust your word on that, obviously. And to me – Roger is obviously not the greatest personality in the world, but you made it to the NFC title game last year and you had a lot of things uh, kind of wrong with your football team that you could have really improved in that spot. Um, I'm just surprised they didn't go wide receiver, maybe linebacker, maybe secondary and try to do something to immediately help your football team. And maybe that's not even the worst pick that they made because then they took a gigantic running back with their second pick. Like you already have Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams as your running backs. You have a great running game already. Like, that makes no sense to me. So if you're and that guy might not be that Aaron good, Rod- right? And and to me, if you're trying to push Aaron Rodgers out the door, you're doing it. Like this could not have made him happy at all. Um, but that's not even the sh- most shocking pick in the first round to me. But I'll I'll let Ryan go first, and you tell me what you were shocked about in the first round. 
there were three things that I was shocked about in the first round. Um, and I'll go in order from least to most. Uh, number one, the Chiefs getting a running back in the first round. What was with that? Like, they won the Super Bowl last year with, didn't you say, a guy who they didn't even draft, a guy, an undrafted Lyons. running back. He was like, undrafted completely, yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I was very confused by that. I know a lot of Chiefs Twitter was basically completely split by that. It seemed like there was a lot of people completely applauding it, thinking that he was going to be – this guy is going to be the next – I don't know, think, thinking that, oh, yeah, this is, this is such a great pick, such a great pick. Oh, running back in first round that isn't, uh, you know, Jonathan Taylor – um, then, the, every, then there was everybody else saying, no, you shouldn't draft until the third round for a running back. I know that's your strategy, Randy. Probably is a smart strategy. The next one was the Lions. We had, what, two weeks worth or three weeks worth of people expecting the Lions to trade back their number three pick and get more draft capital. And we had heard that they were going to have a decision by 3 p.m. You'll hear who this trade is from. And they just didn't make a trade. Mm-hmm. What was with that? Um, and it's just really weird to me that there's all these people that come from Belichick. They see how Belichick works. His idea, you trade back, get more, get more draft capital, and nobody that comes from underneath them does the same exact thing. Um, Matt Patricia's gone after this year. There's just no way around it. And then, obviously, number one is just the Packers doing what they did to get Jordan Love, trading up. I would understand like they, if he fell to them. They felt like that they weren't going to get anything better. I, I think they probably should have went other tackle or receiver. We went through that already. Um, it's got, God, they're so close. And did they even draft a wide receiver this, this draft at all? Nope. So one of the this, most stacked wide receiver classes recently. So you're this day. far, you're this far away from making the Super Bowl. Well, this far away from making the Super Bowl, um, uh, get wrecked by that great, that great running offense by the Niners. And you don't really do anything to improve like very key areas where you need to improve. Uh, Aaron and Rogers contract is front loaded for the first two years. So they can actually get rid of them after the next, after the next two at a very re- at a reasonable cost. And oh God, th- there's just so much to unpack with that Jordan love thing. I just don't understand why you wouldn't try to win now when you have the ability to win now. I th- and yeah, I hate to cut you off here. Ryan. I, I, right. I personally think it was a message sent like they, the, this, the only reason this draft, how they drafted, the way they drafted was to send a message to Aaron Rodgers saying, we don't want you, you know, the, you're not going to tell us what to draft because honestly, their biggest need, in my opinion, if you traded up to 26, you know what would have made sense there? Patrick Queen, the, yep. that should have been the yep. pick because they got murdered off tackle, off tackle, off tackle, off tackle, all game long by the 49ers. They got killed. And they couldn't make adjustments because they didn't. They couldn't man up and do that because they didn't have the personnel. And then we see everything else that took place with them. To me, this was just saying, you know what? We're rebuilding. This was a rebuilding draft for them. That's exactly what it felt like. And we don't want you, Aaron. Yeah, it's uh, it's totally like Rodgers and Favre all over again, except Favre was threatening retirement and kind of felt like he was already hinting towards being out the door anyway. So uh, Rodgers feels like he still has a ton in the tank. Obviously, he's a little older now, but it's it, keep it the was. NFL isn't, keep in mind the NFL isn't the same as it was when when Favre was thirty five. Yeah. The the way the NFL and the league is set up now, they want quarterbacks playing longer because they can play longer. Aaron yep. Rodgers probably on the high end can play for another ten years. We, I mean, we don't know. You have him for another four. He said he wants to end his career as a Packer. It's probably not going to happen anymore. I mean, he's thirty six. He has four years left in his contract. So I mean, he'd be playing until forty under this contract, regardless, unless he, you know, you you push him out like what it looks like it's about to happen now. Um, but it, it's certainly not a good look for the locker room or for Rodgers. Or I can't imagine he's happy about this. I, I, are you, how do you not improve your football team when you're that close to making the Super Bowl? It's, it's gotta be frustrating. Uh, one of my best friends is a Packers fan. He's like, look, I trust their process. They're, they're pros at this. I'm not, I guess that's one way to look at it as a fan and not everyone has to have a hot take about uh, their draft pick. So, um, for me, what really surprised me, I got a couple things, um, it was the Cowboys picking CD lamb. I know that uh, a lot of the, the people go, you know, you go best player available regardless. He obviously had fallen to them. 
Um, but you already have Amari Cooper. You already have Michael Gallup. Uh, you have a good running game. You have a good offensive line. I really thought they could have, um, you know, helped their secondary uh, in this spot. And I'm surprised they didn't go defense here. Um, another pick to me was someone I never even heard of that, the, you know, you got to love the Raiders, right? Because they just do things. And you're like, what the, what are you, what are you thinking? Um, they picked Damon Arnett, the corner from Ohio State, who wasn't even like on many teams' boards and has real bad character issues, and is totally going to fit in as a Raider if that's the case. Um, I just was like, I don't, I don't, I never even heard of that guy in my life. Um, another thing that surprised me a lot too was Philly had Justin Jefferson fall into their lap, and I thought that was the best pick I had in my mock draft. And I was like, I'm going to get another one right. I was so happy, and then they go with. Jalen Rager, the wide receiver from TCU instead, uh, I don't know what the deal is there. I know there were some controversial tweets that Justin Jefferson said he hated Philadelphia, but, like, are you really going to judge to the guy like that? I, I, I don't know, but a lot of Eagles – I hate bad. Philadelphia. We're so I hate Philadelphia, Philadelphia about people hating Philly. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that once you get drafted by a team at that point, your personal feelings about that city should go out the window. Um, but – I was shocked that they didn't pick Justin Jefferson. I thought that was about as much of a lock of a pick uh, in the whole draft. Um, but that was just like some of my first round thoughts um, that, that surprised me. Obviously, Jordan Love was really surprising to me. Um, when they traded up, I was like, all right, they're going to get one of these wide receivers, maybe a, a Brandon Ayuk. Uh, well, actually, Brandon Ayuk was picked right before that pick, actually. So that, But maybe I was thinking like Denzel Mims. Um, one of these wide receivers that everyone raves about. Um, but no, they, they, they picked Jordan Love instead. So, but one of the more, a couple other shocking things in the other rounds to me, I don't know. I want to get your thoughts on this. I know the Patriots are like smug and so smart and so genius. They picked a D2 player in the second round. Um, I don't know anything about this guy, Matt. Do you know anything about this guy? Was any other team even interested in this guy? No, it did. It, it pretty much reeked of, you know, Ryan Pace should have been the GM of the Patriots for that pick because it just reeked of you're reaching for a guy who's not going to be on many draft boards. I think Kuyper said he wasn't projected to go until the third or fourth round. I I mean, it it kills me because obviously these guys scout up and down. I mean, Walter Payton came out of, I think, Jacksonville State, which is in um, Mississippi. So these guys get paid to do this. But, man, if you miss on these guys, it, it, it's so bad. It, it looks so bad. Because, like, when Ryan was flipping out about the Bears taking Cole Komet and he brought up all the tight ends. I mean, this could be Adam Shaheen, for all we know. I mean, obviously he doesn't play tight end, but it, it can blow up in your face pretty bad. Yeah, so Kyle Duggar played Leno- at Lenore Ryan, which is a D2 school, 37th overall. Uh, Ryan, did you do you know anything about this guy? Um, I don't really follow D two as much, but do you know what his uh? Do you know what his two four seven composite was? Um, because there's here's the thing: there's a lot of guys on uh uh that are D two players that may have been on a D one roster and then they get uh cut or they get moved because of character. Uh, they're like a character thing, or they have trouble with uh police or grades or there's like some there there's some other underlying thing going on um i know uh kevin kevin in the group he was a coach at a d2 school and he was saying like oh we're playing this school that had a guy on their defensive line who was from ohio state the year before and then got cut Mm -hmm. for whatever reason or or because they had whatever certain player so what was i don't have a i don't have a keyboard right now well, this is two four seven composite. Did, did anyone look up or? I am not having a great uh, internet connection right What's now. What's his name? Uh, his oh, his, 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 Kyle Duggar. Oh. Kyle. Kyle Duggar. You guys keep talking. I'll look this up. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to look up too much information. Like I said, it, I think it's one of those situations where you, you trust your football people. I mean, I'm not sure where Gronk came out of, but I think Gronk was Arizona, lower. wasn't he? Yeah, I think it was Arizona, to be honest with you. But he, but he was a fourth rounder, I think. He was still later. Gronk was no, he was a second. He got drafted oh, in the second, second round. Yeah. 
Oh, Aaron Hernandez was a fourth rounder. Yeah, man, with those character issues, it's surprised he was a fourth rounder. Yeah, I just I was surprised. NFL like, material. Yeah, I like you picked him over guys like Gitter Gross Matos and Ross Blacklock and, and Jonathan Taylor, which you don't need a running back, but like Grant Telpit totally screams Patriot to me. I'm surprised that they couldn't have gone there. There's just a lot of good players that they picked this guy uh, out of nowhere for, and uh, who am I to to question Bill Belichick and his scouting ability? But well, it seemed like it seemed like to me it was more like, hey, look at me, I can do whatever I want. I'm a genius, and the pick's gonna work because I'm Bill Belichick. Yeah, I mean, and keep in mind his his draft record is, I mean, fifty fifty, so it's not yeah. like he's this vaunted drafter either. So I don't really pay too much attention to. What he's going to be doing, I mean, they needed a tight end. I mean, obviously, that was one of their biggest position of the needs. And they had every tight end sitting on the board. And they're like, nope, passing on all of these guys. Yeah, uh, not the greatest drafters ever. Um, Ryan, did you find what you were looking for? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I, I have, I, I, I'm going to only do it on my phone right now. I can look it up later and make a post about it in the group you guys want if I find anything. Um, but there are a lot of people – I mean, there are, like, a decent amount of people okay. uh, that come from D2 and FCS or whatever that end up panning out, mm-hmm. so. All right. Well, stay tuned to Football Life for more on that uh, from Ryan. I do want to talk about one more player that you both seem to have fallen in love with before the draft, um, Jalen Hurts. I'm a little surprised at his destination. Uh, the Philadelphia Eagles are, picked him up in, I believe, the second or third round. I'm not sure which one, but it was – uh, pretty surprising to me because I, I don't know. I think I'm more of a believer than Carson Wentz than most. But, Ryan, you love Jalen Hurts. What do you make of this? This makes a lot of sense. Carson Wentz is hurt all the time. Um, I know that there's one uh, old adage that the most important position that you have is your quarterback, and your second most important position is your back quarterback. Jalen Hurts is definitely going to get a lot of snaps playing behind Carson Wentz just from being – uh, behind a guy who just can't stay on the field just because of injury-related issues. But um, I think he fits in this offense. I mean, they they did used to run a lot of things upfield to quarterback, did do a lot of it read option. Hurts, I think, is a very great option at backup for Carson Wentz, a guy who's going to come in for probably four or five games when he eventually goes down. Matt, I assume you feel similarly. And is there any chance that Jalen Hurts could be sort of a Taysom Hill type gimmick guy until that happens? To answer your question, there is no chance he's a Taysom Hill gimmick guy. I think he has a lot more ability than Taysom Hill at the quarterback position. The one situation is complicated because if and when – Wentz was healthy. You're talking about a top 10 quarterback in the NFL. He's an MVP candidate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that – would he have won the Super Bowl with the Eagles? I think you can make a case that he very well could have. Yeah. My, my issue with Wentz is health. And once you start getting those injuries, does it derail your ability to play the position? I mean, his injuries, you can't ignore them for what they have been. So – Hurts under Doug Peterson, who is is a fantastic football mind. I I think if anybody can get the most out of Jalen Hurts, it's definitely a guy on the Andy Reid trade not named Matt Nagy. So I I, I think it was a good pick. I I think Hurts will succeed in Philly, and I would be surprised if Wentz is still the quarterback there in four years. I just – you you can't live with a quarterback that's always hurt. I mean, it, it kills your continuity. It kills your offense. There has to be stability at that position. And if you don't have that with your starting quarterback, there's a lot of years where, you know, your season's going to end early. I know a lot of Eagles fans living in the Northeast, and a lot of them are upset with Howie Roseman in this draft. But uh, I told them, I'm like, look, you can't just – I mean, for years the Cowboys had to find some guy to play behind Tony Romo because he got hurt every single year. Um, when you have a guy who's fragile, you need that insurance. And it's the same thing we talked about with Dak earlier with Andy Dalton. Like you, the, the backup quarterback is so important in the NFL. Uh, and I think the Eagles have become one of the better run organizations in the league. And I think they're going to make this work. I was just surprised at the pick. I, it kind of caught me off guard. I thought there was a lot of teams with quarterback needs that I could have seen in it. And it kind of makes me question the Packers decision even more that they traded up for a guy like Jordan Love. Like why couldn't they have just picked the guy like Jalen Hurts? Uh, maybe with the first round pick or even a second round pick 
um, to replace to, to to fill that role that they were looking for from Jordan Love. I mean, maybe they love Jordan Love more than anyone in the world, but that just surprised me. I know that you had fond feelings for him, but uh, I I'm just surprised. I think that a guy like Jalen Hurts really could be a better pro, a much better pro than Jordan Love, and he fell and landed in a great situation. So I think he will succeed. I actually would like to point out that I did find more information about him. Um, he doesn't have uh, any composite score, but it looks like the high school that he was at, he was playing behind somebody during his junior year who was going to be uh, playing at an FBS level school. So it was just more that he didn't have enough. It looks like from what articles I'm reading is that he didn't have enough tape for schools to judge him and they just kind of fell into a D2 school. Okay. I, I wonder how often that happens. I'm surprised about that because scouts, yeah. Yeah, scouts, I mean, they can't get everywhere. So, uh, all right. So, just a couple quick hitter segments here about the draft. Uh, Matt, give me a sleeper pick that you liked and maybe a later round pick that really that you were happy with. Uh, I hate to be a homer here, but Gibson, um, the kid the Bears drafted at the defensive line position, I, I love his ability to either play outside linebacker or defensive end. Um, obviously, Pace had to trade up to get him. Also, and I, I hate to say this, but every defensive player the Bears drafted, I loved. I loved Vildor. I loved Johnson. I loved this Gibson kid. Um, I, I just loved everything they did defensively. Offensively, I hated everything but one pick. Okay, Ryan, what about you? Any late round, like mid late round picks that you really, you know, a sleeper pick that you like? Um. I can't remember the, the names off the top of my head, but the one thing that really surprised me in this draft is how well the Dolphins drafted in general. I was honestly kind of expecting them with as many first-round picks to probably just miss on all of them, but it looks like that they kind of have an actual, a real idea of what they want to do with their offense. And, uh, yeah, that, that was just something that kind of surprised me. Okay. I mean, I, I, I went Zach Bond. I had him going in the first round of my mock. He went to New Orleans in the third round. I think that's a great get for them. Uh, and then Denzel Mims, I also had going in the first round, and the Jets got him also in a later round. And I think that that's going to help their wide receiver core big time. What about you? What's up, Matt? Josh Jones in the third round to the Cardinals. You it's took... a great fall. I, I can't believe he fell. I, I really thought he was going to go higher than that. And I'll say this. Cardinals did a fantastic job in the draft. I'm, I'm not the biggest Simmons fan. I worry about where he'll play in the NFL defensively, if he's going to be able to put on weight. But – the Cardinals used to have Dion Buchanan, who was kind of a tweener between safety and linebacker. I kind of feel the same way with Simmons, although Simmons should help that defense be a little more versatile. But, man, you include the Hopkins trade with their yeah. draft class. I mean, a home run. And to Ryan's point, I mean, the Dolphins aced this thing. They did so well in the draft. Yeah, I, t- I mean, when, especially if you consider Hopkins that second round pick, it's just like insane what the what the Cardinals did with this draft. I really love what the Panthers did with this draft too, uh, pairing Brown and Yuter Gross Matos. I, I I really do love what they did too. Um, I actually kind of like what the Giants did with this draft. I don't think it was sexy, but I think it was it was smart. I think that they went offensive line. I don't know I don't know how to judge offensive tackles in college, so whatever their opinion on Andrew Thomas, okay whatever he's obviously the guy who had the best character that fits their program like okay whatever um i'm happy they addressed the offensive line they got the best safety in the draft in the second round you can't really be mad at that value so um i think they took a couple chances in the, here and there but I, I can't be mad at them with the giants in the draft i don't think they tanked by any means so uh i can't be mad at, at the draft for the g men okay this is one of my favorite parts of this this podcast here coming up um this is going to be the last part of the show, and I want to hear your worst pick of the entire 2020 NFL draft. Ryan, I'm sure you have a great one here. I have two worst picks. Number two is uh, I was expecting the Browns to pick the, at the time, 15th best receiver, and he climbed up to the seventh best receiver, Michael Pittman. Uh, yeah. And they did not. They, they, were, they actually had a fairly solid draft, especially early rounds. But – I made a leap of faith expecting the Bears to completely implode and trade away the house to be desperate for a first-round pick and trade away Khalil Mack. Uh, and, God, Matt, y'all right? Y'all right? Yeah, no, I'm fine. I, I, I'm happy with the Bears draft. I, yeah, much. yeah. I, I thought the Bears actually drafted fairly well. And, uh, 
yeah, I was pleasantly surprised that they decided not to just uh, throw everything away because they were desperate. So. Okay, Matt, let me hear it. You were very bold in ha- declaring a particular player in your mock draft to be the worst player selected in the draft. Now that is all said and done, who was the worst pick in the 2020 NFL draft? Well, it's it's not Jordan Love because he got picked at the right spot, in my opinion. Um, I, I, I hate to say this, Randy, because I, I really know the pain and suffering you have with the Giants, but I can't – Getting the third or fourth best offensive lineman and taking him first, you know, the first offensive lineman taken at number four, I can't rationalize in my head. Yeah, he's he's stable, but I mean, at best, he's a right tackle, and it feels kind of like you already have a right tackle in Nate Shoulder, Nate Shoulder, and you're still missing that left tackle spot. I just with, oh God, I mean, I, I mean, maybe Austin Jackson was better than wow. Brown. I mean, I, I hated the pick because there were so many other really good offensive linemen out there. Thomas should have fell between the 12 and 18 range. That's where he should have been drafted at, behind two or three other linemen. I won't pretend to sit here and tell you the difference between all those offensive linemen. I know that there are experts who said Werfs and Wills were better and Becton is the size of a house. So like, I get it. Um, but to me, there were four big four, there were four offensive linemen that like were like the, the cream of the crop in this draft and the Giants got one of them. So um, I'm okay with it. I, I don't think it's like the worst pick ever. I think that like they went through Eric Flowers and they expected a lot from him. I don't love picking an offensive tackle at four who might have to transition into a position that he didn't play a lot in college, but he did play left tackle um, quite a bit for Georgia, but um, Nate Solder is not a good off, not a good left tackle. Nate Solder needs to be right tackle and then get right off the team because he's horrible and horribly overpaid. So they, they needed to do. Uh, I'm sorry, but yeah, you, you didn't draft a left tackle. You drafted a right tackle. And but he, but he did play left tackle in Georgia, and I know a lot of scouts had him as a right tackle. But if you look at other teams' boards, they all had Andrew Thomas at the top of their their leaderboard. Like it's a discrepancy between scouts and these draft analysts. Uh, analysts and the people who actually do the scouting for teams so I don't know who to trust here all I know is like I, I don't hate the pick hopefully he works out I'm not gonna like put, like put my eggs in all that basket like the Giants don't do a good job with a lot of things so if he doesn't work out I will not be shocked I promise you but I didn't hate the, th- the thought process there like to me like I can't tell you the difference between all of these offensive linemen I mean Will's played right tackle his whole career in college, I know that part of that was Tua, but he would also be having the shift to left tackle, which he didn't play. So, is work purpose of the decision there? I mean, I don't... The, I, the, the issue is that you could have had Thomas, if you, even if you traded down four spots, and th- there was no movement. Wirtz was the best offensive lineman in this draft by a considerable margin. I mean, if you look at the game tape, I know it's the big time, but he, I mean, he went one-on-one with Chase Young. I mean, th- this guy's played against premier pass rushers and not saying that Thomas hasn't, but. He plays in the SEC. He plays against great defensive players all the time. I mean, you can make a case that the SEC wasn't that great defensively this year. But he played there for three years. I mean, he had whole like three whole years of defensive players. The, in the SEC, SEC and the big 10 last year were both pretty solid defensively. The, there's kind of a rivalry between those two co- fans of two conferences, but they were both very solid defensively last year. And one thing that Big Ten schools are also known for, especially in the northern Midwest, are having those big li- those big linemen that they recruit. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. Just, I, I, I don't want to, like, bash it entirely. Because, yeah, they drafted a position of need, but it just feels like if you're picking that high and, and you're the Giants – I mean, I don't know. It, to me, it feels like a reach when you had Wills, Wirtz, uh, guy can't, Bakhtiari, not Bakhtiari, that's the Packers left Beckton. tackle. Beckton. Beckton, yeah. And, I mean, if, if Thomas works out, I got I got my face. You, you guys hit a home run. I was completely wrong about this. But still, it's, it feels like Daniel Jones. You could have had Daniel Jones at 17 instead of 6. Look, I'm not going to argue with you about trading back. I've been begging for them to trade back for the last three years. 
I I understand that point. But if they made, then you can't trade back. I think that they totally should have done a better job. As soon as the Lions made that pick, you could have tried to get the Dolphins or whoever. Like, hey, we you can have two or Herbert right now. Give us an extra fourth round pick, and he's yours. You know, and they're not smart enough to negotiate things like that. And maybe teams really weren't. They're like, maybe the Dolphins were like, you know what? Yeah, if someone gets two, we'll take Herbert. Like, maybe they didn't care. But I just, maybe maybe they didn't try hard enough. I don't think Gettleman's smart enough, really, to negotiate that kind of thing. So trading back, I will not argue with you about that. They absolutely should have traded back. I think they could have traded back, you know, uh, even to 10 or in the 12 area, and they still could have got one of those offensive linemen. But to me, what I heard was that he was number one tackle on the board for a lot of NFL teams. Uh, and um, they fell in love with his personality. He was a giant. He had that, you know, traditional, he had a character and all this stuff. Like, I mean, spare me with the, the, the character talk because it's backfired before, but Gettleman's not going to do anything outlandish at this point. Matt, I saw that you had something else to say, so go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I, I was just wondering, so I, Let's look. At, has Gettleman ever traded back? Did he ever trade back with the Panthers? Never, never once in his, his life has he traded back. It's a fair criticism. It's totally fair. Yeah, I mean, maybe Thomas works out. Um, uh, other than that, but m- my other bad one was Dallas, and the same complaint I have with Dallas that I have with the Giants. Now you couldn't have got C.D. Lamb if you traded back, but it was an enormously rich wide receiver draft. They had other needs. They should, out of any team in this draft, that's the one that should have traded down and got extra picks. They could have helped sustain their offensive line. They could have got Cesar Ruiz in the 20s, uh, Austin Jackson maybe a little bit later on, a couple of picks later if they wanted to trade with the Dolphins, if the Dolphins wanted C.D. Lamb. A question for you, Matt, though. So um, I, was it you that suggested that there was probably more to that Andy Dalton signing uh with that was that you or randy earlier oh no no it was me okay so kind of going off like the point with rogers too if there's more to that debt to that with Dak, do you think that they would go out of their way to get him more weapons to make him look better this year well i mean what are weapons when your offensive line is deteriorating in front of your eyes i mean travis yeah. Frederick is gone I mean, you had to replenish that. Basically, you're giving Dak another wide receiver when you just paid Amari Cooper five years, $100 million. I mean, the defense, the the offense wasn't the problem for the Cowboys. They re-signed a linebacker for an enormous contract that can't move sideline to sideline. You know, I I love Jalen Smith. Great story. He can run north and south, but he ain't covering east and west. He can be exploited in a lot of offenses in today's NFL. Their secondary is absolute trash with Byron, Byron Jones going. So, yeah, you drafted CeeDee Lamb, and let's say you want to make Dak look better. I, I, that's great. You're not winning football games. You know, you can score 50 points a game, and they're still going to go 8-8 eight and eight like they did last year. They, they went to Soldier Field and got obliterated by the Bears. So th- I see so many issues with the Cowboys and you drafted a position that, yeah, best player on the board, but man, you got Amari Cooper. Your other wide receivers aren't awful. You got Z. Michael, Mac- Michael Gallup is good. Yeah. I, I'm, the, to, to me, it's just, you, you did something that you didn't have to do in a way. This was the one draft, Ryan, where I, I will stand my foot in the ground and say, there was no need to draft a wide receiver in the first round if you needed a number two or a number three wide receiver. This, this draft was not the draft to do that because there were too many damn good wide receivers falling all over the place in the second and third round. And the Cowboys do what Jerry Jones always does. He wants to make the splash pick when for so many years he did so well. And I have a point about Jerry Jones. The Cowboys could not help themselves with this pick because you know who really needs a wide receiver? The Philadelphia Eagles in their own division could have really used a guy like C.D. Lamb, and they could not for a second let him fall to them. So I guarantee you the Cowboys took C.D. Lamb in spite of the Philadelphia Eagles. Whether it makes their team that much better or not, I guarantee Jerry Jones did that just because, hey, Philly, we got three stud wide receivers. You don't even have one. I guarantee that's why he did that. And he gave him, and this is what Jerry does. He does, oh, I'm going to give you 88 to keep the Cowboys tradition going strong. 
Uh, hey, Randy, I, I actually want to, uh, I misunderstood the question when we first started this. I thought we were talking about our own worst picks for some reason. Because I've no, I, a short, short, short No, I want, I want to know who you thought was the worst pick in the whole draft was. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not going to say Jordan Love just because we've already talked that to death, that point to death, but I do think that that is. The other one is that random ass running back the Lions picked like at the beginning of the second round. Like they picked a guy. Yeah, Greg Swift. I, could, I, thought, I thought they picked yeah, Swift. They, they, they picked him over Jonathan Taylor. Yeah. And they drafted a running back that high for, you know, he's going to split they have, with somebody else that they carry on. Position. Carry on Johnson's a good, yeah. Carry on Johnson's a good player. I'm yeah. Surprised they, they, they didn't need that position. And yeah. I, so either in the Jordan Love, I thought that was like the, just the dumbest move in the first 60 picks, 64 picks. Okay. I, mean, I got one. Go ahead, Matt. Ooh, go ahead before I go. Oh, I was going to say, I mean, the, the Lions got pretty good draft grades. I mean, th- they – people love the DeAndre Swift pick. I mean, I like you guys said, with on Johnson, I, I don't see the stinking need for it, but Lions are going to lie in. Okay. Well, I'm, we're going to wrap this up with my worst pick in the draft. And not very often is someone who is from the area that I'm from, the capital region of the great state of New York. Uh, the area code of 518, the place that I so proudly represent every time I go on one of these groups, Henry makes fun of me for. Um, but there was a kid who went to high school in this area and went to Marshall and is a kicker. And the Patriots picked him in the fifth round. His name is Justin Browasser. The reason he's the worst pick in the draft is that he's a white supremacist. And that is the only reason I need. <laughs> and that's the reason I'm sticking with. And of course, it's the Patriots. And that does not surprise me. So I can go on and give Bill Belichick all the credit in the world. Yeah, it, so, it, it was an awful pick. But he drafted him, so. And it's and he is really dumb. By he, he has a, literally a watchfulness tattoo. One can see it. So doesn't seem like the brightest guy ever either. So yeah, good job, Patriots. Said, good job, Bill. And Belichick. his reason was he didn't balls. know what it was. He just thought it was like a Bull- gun. Shit. <laughs> yeah, I, I call bullshit on that. Uh, all right, so this has gone on for way longer than I anticipated. I don't know about you guys, but we've been live for nearly two hours now, if not longer than the, I don't know if we clipped the two hour mark or not. But uh, we're going to say goodbye now. Stay tuned tomorrow on In Ball is Life, where we have Jacob and Anthony, and uh, Henry's joining them because they're going to recap uh, episodes five of six of The Last Dance, the only sporting related show going on right now worth a damn watching. Uh, I can't wait to watch their recap of that uh, and the polarizing figure known as Michael Jordan in the 90s Chicago Bulls. Um, but that does it for it for now. Matt, do you have any parting words for the audience? Stay tuned. Even though NFL news may be slowly dying out, there are some sneaky conversations we're going to have, and you may see some persistent rapping at Ryan's back door after I get done with them. Is that a reference to something? Those who know will get it. Those who don't okay. won't. Okay. Well, Ryan, this is the fourth consecutive show you've hopped on here for us. Thanks so much for being a part of all of this. Do you have any thoughts on your time here on the Deep Thirds Football Podcast? It's pretty neat. <laughs> neat like your hair flip and your beard. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as always, I look forward to doing it with you guys again. Like I said, tomorrow, Saturday morning, and Ball is Life. To, to, uh, Check out the step back. They're going to talk about the last dance. It should be a must watch show. Thank you guys so much for watching our show today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you all stay safe, stay healthy, uh, stay inside, and we'll see you guys soon. Take care.